Hello, everyone. This is the 24th episode of the Soccer Nostalgia Talk podcast. As always, this is Sean from Los Angeles, and I'm joined by Paul from Shipley in England. For this episode, we start a new series with Mr. Gavin Buckland and Mr. Stephen Pye as we discuss the English League season by season, starting with the 1980-1981 season. Mr. Buckland is, among other things, Everton's official statistician, question of sport, script consultant, radio Merseyside regular, and Liverpool Echo Royal Blue podcaster. Mr. Pye is a blogger, and his blog is that 1980s sports blog and he's also a contributor to guardian sport network and the gooner welcome gavin welcome steven how are you ah pleasure to be asked on okay great thanks thank you so please tell us about yourselves and your personal football journey well i've been an, an Everton fan nearly well 50 years i suppose so as a kid been going the game for most of that that period, but obviously I've always taken a big interest in the wider sport, not just football, but a lot of the time now is based around football really, you know, I've also done a few books uh, on, on quiz books and I recently did last year a book on Everton in the 1960s, when you can't buy us love, and I've always been a keen historian really, of not just football history, but sporting history, but more and more football, so that's really where, where I've, I've come from and hopefully why I've been asked on, you know. Hey, Stephen? Yeah, um, I started supporting Arsenal in about 1983, I think it was a bit of an interesting time for the club. But similar to Gavin, really, kind of really interested in sports history. Growing up in the 80s, there were so many sort of different characters in sports in the 80s. So, you know, like Daley Thompson, Ian Botham in other sports, um, Eric Bristow even. So a few years back, I was thinking... I should try and put that to some use, my knowledge of the 80s. So started a sports blog. Lucky enough to be picked up by the Guardian, so that's really good. Yeah, don't get to go to as many matches at the top level now. I sort of follow the National League now, so me and my son go to Bournemouth quite a lot. So okay. Yeah, no, just um, as Gavin said, I'm chuffed to be on, the, on this podcast because it's um, talking about an era I really enjoyed. So. Thank you. The 1980-81 English Football League season started at a time when English clubs had a monopoly in the Champions Cup. Brown clubs, Nottingham Forest, had just won its second straight Champions Cup following Liverpool's two consecutive wins in 1977 and 78. Defending champions Liverpool were the dominant side of the day, having won four of the last five titles, with Nottingham Forest winning a single title in 1978. So in presenting this 1980-81 season, before discussing this uh, season, I will go through with each team and describe their main transfer activity along with naming the better known players on the team. I won't go through every single player transfer, but just the significant ones with better known players, nor will I read the full team rosters, but just name the familiar names so that everyone will have a general idea on the teams and the players on display. So as I go through, please interrupt me at any point and say your thoughts as they come through your mind. In addition, since this is England, there will be transfers during the season. And as we go through our discussion, the significant transfers during the seasons will also be discussed. So let's start alphabetically with Arsenal. Now, Arsenal's main transfer activity in the summer of 1980 was star Irish midfielder Liam Brady transferring out to Juventus. And uh, also, we must bear in mind that uh, Man United were actually willing to pay a larger transfer fee for Liam Brady. But uh, because of their wage structure, they could not give Liam Brady the salaries that he desired. And as a result, he joined Juventus. That was the main player going out. Now, there was a significant transfer this summer for Arsenal. First, the very famous Clive Allen transfer. They signed Clive Allen they signed Clive Allen from Queen's Park Rangers. However, 
they almost immediately swapped him with defender Kenny Sansom, England international of Crystal Palace, who would stay on with the club for more than a decade. At the time, this swap was a big news item. What do you guys remember from this whole back and forth? Well, going back to the Liam Brady one, just quickly, I think he went for £600,000, which considering people like Steve Daly were going for over a million back then, that was... (laughs) quite a cheap fee so Juventus obviously got a bargain there but yes and I was going to say Man United were willing to pay 900,000 it's just before my time sporting Arsenal but I know a lot of Arsenal fans who, who say they're quite happy that he went to Juventus even if it was for less money because they obviously didn't want him in a Man United shirt terrorizing you know mm-hmm. Arsenal's defense but the Clive Allen one's obviously a strange one it seemed like a sensible signing at the time because I think Arsenal had Stapleton and Sunderland up front and a lot was made of this new SAS attack apparently but he played three games in friendlies and I think Terry Neal decided that the three of them together just didn't work it was obviously wasn't a squad game back then you kind of had your one to eleven but there were also rumours that QPR never wanted to sell Clive Allen directly to Crystal Palace so there was kind of a go between that these are obviously big conspiracy theories but but yeah it was a bit typical of Arsenal to kind of spend a million, over a million on a striker and then replace him after about 62 days with a fullback. So, but yeah, there's some strange times really. Gavin, as an Everton fan, do you know who Arsenal initially approached as a prospective replacement but backed out? They were after Peter of Reeds, weren't they? Yes, yes. Yeah, um, and Everton were after Peter of Reeds as well. Um, both, both Everton and Arsenal. I think Reed's changed enough his wage demands were considered too high by both clubs. And yeah, it was a bit of ill repute at the time. I think he was no more as Peter Reddy's, I think, <laughs> rather than Peter Reed. And he ended up, of course, staying at Bolton for a couple of years. I think he was up for £600,000. We'll talk about his transfer to Evan, hopefully, in a later show. But, you know, he obviously went for far less than that. Yeah, it was interesting. I think Arsenal were also interested in Andy King, who was with Everton as well, who went to QPR. So, I mean, you've got to see that. I think it's important to see like transfers in this this time as the game economically was struggling. And I think there was a lot of criticism of football with declining attendances, yet they were still paying enormous <laughs> amounts of, of money. You know, for for players, and as you say, some of the players you mentioned there, not great players, had enormous fees spent on them, you know. And we need also, in the history of this season in particular, it was frowned upon at a time when the nation was struggling, people, like three million people out of work. It was a very unpopular thing to be to throw money around. Arsenal's other significant transfer was Scottish goalkeeper George Wood coming on from Everton. Terry Neal's Arsenal side you had... Pat Jennings, the legendary Northern Ireland goalkeeper, George Wood, John Devine, David O'Leary, Kenny Sansom, John Hollins, Graham Ricks, Brian Talbot, Frank Stapleton, Alan Sunderland, Paul Vassen. Those would be some of the better known names for that season. As far as Aston Villa, the main transfer activity was the signing of Striker Peter Witt from Newcastle. Lesser known player Alex Crapley, also from Newcastle. Ron Saunders' squad was a stable squad. Jimmy Rimmer, Eamon DC, Scottish defender Alan Evans, Colin Gibson, Ken McNaught, Kenny Swain, Gary Williams, Des Bremner, Gordon Cowens, Dennis Mortimer, Tony Morley, Gary Shaw. We'll discuss this whole squad again uh, at the end of the season. Newly promoted Birmingham City, managed by Jim Smith, who I believe he passed away this year, right? Yeah. Right. yeah. They got Frank Worthington back. He was on loan with Mayalbi. They also signed Irish uh, forward Don Givens from Burnmouth and Republic of Ireland defender David Langan from Derby County. Other players on the squad, you had Colin Todd, Pat Vandenhow, Alan Ainska, Alan Kirbishley, and Archie Gemmel. And we'll discuss this. Tony Cotton would make his debut in this season as an 18-year-old. Then we have Brighton with Alan Mullery as manager. They signed Mosh Garyani, an Israeli defender from Maccabi Netanya. 
Michael Robinson from Man City. Players leaving the club were Martin Chivers, who left to join Dorchester Town, and Ray Clark, who joined Newcastle. Some of the famous names on the squad were Irish defender Mark Lawrenson, the big defender with the headband, Steve Foster, Gary Andrew Stevens, future Tottenham player, John Gregory, Brian Horton, who I believe he managed Man City in the 90s, right? Brian Horton. Yeah, he did, yeah. Yeah, yeah. not very successfully. Yeah. <laughs> and Jerry Ryan. Next, we have Coventry City managed by Gordon Mill. They signed Jerry Daly from Derby County. And more better known names leaving the club were Bobby McDonald, who joined Man City, and Ian Wallace, who joined Nottingham Forest. The better known names on the squad were Scottish goalkeeper Jim Blith, the late Les Silly, Danny Thomas, Jerry Daly, Gary Gillespie, Steve Hunt, a young Mark Haitley, Belgian player Roger Van Gool, and Scottish player Tommy Hutchison. Next, we have Crystal Palace, managed by Terry Venables. They got Tony Silly from Portwell, and obviously we mentioned Clive Allen from Arsenal. And players leaving the club were Kenny Sansom and Steve Kembler, who joined Vancouver Whitecaps in the NASL. Crystal Palace had the likes of Terry Fennick, Vince Hilaire, and Welsh international Steve Lovell, among their better known names. So now we come to Everton, managed by Gordon Lee. Interestingly, I read that Gordon Lee was under instructions from Everton management to restore some order because there had been too many yellow cards in a previous season. Yeah, they, 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 were, they were in front of the, the FI during the summer of 1980 that the disciplinary record was dreadful. I mean, I think you got banned if you reached 20 points. I mean, Brian Kidd reached 40, wow. <laughs> including in the previous campaign, including the unusual feat of being sent off twice in the FA Cup in the same season, which is... a uh, Take some going. Yeah, yeah. So there was disciplinary issues there are plenty. And not just at Evan, but a lot of football. But Evan was particularly bad, you know. And Gordon, this is a, this is a big season for Gordon. He'd been there three years. Right. Uh, and he had to deliver really something this season or he'd be under pressure. Everton offloaded Scottish goalkeeper George Wood to Arsenal. And also Brian Kidd left the club and joined Bolton. The only significant player coming in was uh, Republic of Ireland goalkeeper Seamus McDonough from Bolton. At Everton, you had the likes of John Bailey, John Gidman, Mick Lyons, Kevin Ratcliffe, Asa Hartford, Steve McMahon, Gary Mixon, Bob Latchford, Eamon O'Keefe. Graham Sharp would make a handful of appearances in the season. Yeah as well as Imer Varadi. Varadi is an interesting player. He was born to Hungarian parents in Hammersmith, all places, and then became a, a much-travelled striker in English football during the decade. Yeah, he played for a number of clubs, I remember. Yeah, he played, yeah. played for Newcastle. He had his best days probably Sheffield Wednesday in the, in the mid-80s, as we'll say. Ended up at Leeds. He was a speedy striker. His finishing was not necessarily the, the best. That the highlights, I know we might talk about the highlights of Imre Ferrari's season was scoring against Liverpool in the Merseyside derby. And he celebrated by running towards Liverpool fans and he got hit by a meat pie in the face. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, so I wrote a blog about that a few years ago. It's quite um, quite. Yeah, amazing. yeah. And it's, it's, I always thought it was one of these apocryphal tales, but th- thankfully, because of the internet, you can see the film now clearly. <laughs> And he does actually, you can see the pie hitting him in the face. It was, it was a bit bizarre, you know. Yeah, Gordon Lee, Gordon Lee said about him, his, his pace may frighten opponents, but his finishing frightens the life out of me, you know. But, <laughs> yeah. so, he had a very storied AC's career, Emre Ferrari, you know. Now we come to Ipswich. Perhaps, I would say probably the better side this season, but again, that's for up for debate. And They did not have much transfer activity as Bobby Robson had an already settled squad. So you had Paul Cooper, 
George Burley, Terry Butcher, Mick Mills, Russell Osman, Kevin Beatty, Dutch midfielders Arnold Muren and Francis Tyson, John Wark, Alan Brazil, Eric Gates, Paul Mariner, and Kevin O'Callaghan. So a very fine side and very good side. And we'll talk more about this squad as we discuss the season. Next, we have Leeds United that were somewhat on the way down at this point. They were managed by James Adamson early in the season. They offloaded Tony Curry to QPR. The major signing was Argentinian midfielder and future national team manager Alejandro Sabella from Sheffield United. Obviously, they would be relegated the following season, and this season will also give an indication of their troubles on and off the pitch. Next, we have newly promoted Leicester. They didn't have much transfer activity when it comes to well-known players. The team was managed by Jock Wallace, and they had the likes of Northern Irish international John O'Neill, another Northern Irish international Paul Ramsey, Kevin McDonald, who would join Liverpool in a few seasons' time, Ian Wilson, Andy Peake, and a young Gary Lineker. Next, we come to Liverpool, the team of the moment, managed by Bob Paisley. They didn't have much transfer activity. They had a settled squad. They brought in the little-known player, Richard Money, from Fulham. They offloaded Frank McGarvey to Celtic. The players on this team, I mean, they, the names speak for themselves. Ray Clements, Steve Ogruzovic, Avi Cohen, Israeli defender, Alan Hansen, Alan Kennedy, Phil Neal, Phil Thompson, Jimmy Case, Ray Kennedy, Sammy Lee, Terry McDermott, Kevin Sheedy, Graham Sunes, Ronnie Villan, Kenny Daglish, Mr. Number 12, David Faircloth, and David Johnson, and Ian Rush. Yeah, Rush had just been bought in the summer, hadn't he, for, for £300,000 from Chester, which I think was a record for a, a teenager in this country. He would spend a lot of the time in the reserves. The, the one the one you mentioned there, which is quite interesting, is Frank McGarvey, isn't it? <laughs> he bought from Celtic the season before. Didn't play for him, so so back to Parkhead, but he managed to get caught, caught by Scotland. <laughs> he was at Liverpool, even though he didn't even get in the first team. So, yeah, I mean, we'll talk about it later, but that that team was, it was sort of needing a bit, bit of, you know, you can you see there with some of the names in that team. There's a lot of younger names who would then come through, like Whelan and Rush later on in, in the campaign and into the following season. So it was a, a little team in transition, I think, Liverpool in 1980. So next we have Man City, managed by Malcolm Allison. He brought in Bobby McDonald from Coventry and offloaded Michael Robinson to Brighton. So the names on his team were Joe Corrigan, Paul Power, Dragoslav Stepanovich, Clyde Wilson, Polish star, Kazimierz Dana, Kevin Reeves, Dennis Stewart. They were struggling this season on and off the pitch, especially in the early going. We discussed uh, the documentary of Man City for the season, and that's an interesting watch. And if we can, hopefully we'll discuss some aspects of it. Next, we have Man United managed by Dave Sexton who had gotten close in the league race in a previous season. Man United did not bring in, in this early season, anyone of renown, but uh, they did offload Stuart Houston to Sheffield United. Man United squad, we had Gary Bailey, Arthur Albiston, Martin Buchan, Mike Doxbury, Nikola Jovanovic, Jimmy Grinhoff, Gordon McQueen, Kevin Morin, Jimmy Nicole, Steve Copel, Ashley Grimes, Lou Macari, Sammy McElroy, Ray Wilkins, Mickey Thomas, and Joe Jordan. So a good side 
who would somewhat struggle this season. Next, we have Millsborough. They didn't have much transfer activity. Uh, they were managed by John Neal, and they had the likes of Jim Platt, the forever understudy to Pat Jennings at Northern Ireland, David Armstrong, Craig Johnson, who would make an impact this season, and Terry Cochran from Northern Ireland. Then we have Norwich City. They brought in Joe Royal from Bristol City and Yugoslav Drazen Muzinic from Haydek Split. And the players leaving the club, the most significant one was uh, Martin Peters, who left to join Sheffield United. In Norwich, you had players like Joe Royal and Justin Fashanu as some of the better known players. Then we come to two-time defending European champions, Nottingham Forest of Brian Cloth. He brought in Ian Wallace from Coventry and Swiss international midfielder Raimondo Ponte from Grasshopper Zurich. The significant departure was Stan Bowles, who joined Leighton. This strong team contained the likes of Peter Shilton in goal, Viv Anderson, Kenny Burns, Frank Gray, Larry Lloyd, John McGovern, John Robertson, Terry Francis, Gary Burles early in the season, and we'll discuss that later. It was a good side, but uh, you could see that perhaps in this season, they would go on somewhat of a downward spiral in the sense that they would never really be title challengers probably from this point on. Yeah, I, th- I think with Forrest, they, they started to lose their touch a little bit in the transfer market because you mentioned Ian Wallace. He was a bit of a flop, really. I think they paid $1.25 million for Ian Wallace. Yes. And then you mentioned Justin Fashion earlier on at Norwich and they, they bought him probably the next season. I can't remember. And yeah, he didn't <laughs> do very well at the city ground either. So I think about 1982, it might have been Peter Taylor left. So I think it was just the start of the sort of turn, that great Forest team, really. So. Obviously, they would qualify later in the decade in the UEFA Cup, but that was it. I, they were never really challengers after that, it seemed like. Now we come to Southampton with Laurie McManamy. And you have the biggest transfer of the season with Kevin Keegan returning to the English football from Hamburg. Obviously, this made a lot of headlines at the time. Mighty Mouse returning to the English League, still at the top of his game. The main speculation during the previous season was where was he going to land, in fact. That was a big transfer discussion. Do you guys know why he settled on Southampton, given his talents? I, I don't. I can't remember the full story about this, but isn't there somebody? There's a story, isn't it, about um, wasn't somebody doing some work at Laurie McManamy's house, and he wanted to pa- he wanted to pass for a light or something. The only place he could get it was Hamburg. <laughs> I do hope that's true. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think it's true, isn't it? And that yeah. that's, that that started the chain of events. No, oh, brilliant. That that led to led to Keegan coming to to Hamburg. Coming to, to Southampton, I remember the day vividly because it, I mean, it was obviously the previous season. It was, I think, it was about the February eighty, and it, it was the way the game was changed, isn't it? That Laurie, I think, had tipped off the press, hadn't he? You know, to turn up at this half at your hotel, saying it's it's the big one. You know, you won't be disappointed. It's a complete loss of secrecy. Mm-hmm. Out of out of stage left, Kevin Keegan. Yeah. The previous which you just couldn't imagine that type of transfer. Happening, I mean, I think Laurie had that like sort of ability to get the best out of players who were reaching the end of their careers. You know, John, I'm not sure whether you've gone through their squad, but if you have a look at their squad that season, there's a lot of there's that old question, isn't it, about the team that had four or five England captains in, wasn't it? it was yes, let's 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 go through that team. You had Ivan Golak, Chris Nicole, Dave Watson. A young Steve Williams, Mick Shannon, Charlie George, and Phil Boyer, who would join in November, actually. But yeah, I guess uh, a lot of veterans on that side. 
Yeah. And, and uh, during that season, Alan Ball had started the campaign as manager of Blackpool and he just didn't fancy it after a few months and he ended up going back to Southampton, didn't he? Yes, as a 35-year-old. Yeah, yes. him, and, him and Shannon, right. you know, were big mates. And so that added to the, you know, the senior senior pros there. But it was a good team at that time, Southampton, I think. Mac Benamy, he may be going to, may talk about later at some point, he may have had the opportunity to move elsewhere. But it was, uh, yeah, interesting team. Very difficult place to go to, the Dell, then in the early 80s. Next, we have Stoke City, managed by Alan Durban. The significant player coming in was Scottish defender Ian Munro, and players leaving included the likes of Garth Crooks, who joined Tottenham, and uh, Melvin Paik, who joined Hereford United. They had the likes of Mike Doyle, Lee Chapman, and a uh, young Adrian Heath, future yeah. Everton player, yes. Yeah, I think Paul Bracewell was there as well. Oh, yes. Did he make appearances yeah. that season? Or was I, I, think, I think he may have done, yeah. yeah. He later played, played at Gordeson later on in the season. So, yeah, they, they were a decent young team. They, they'd come up, I think, the, the couple of years before, had Heath and Stoke with, with Alan Durban. And, yeah, they had a couple, couple of good young, young players there at, at Stoke City. You, have, you know, there's... Three or four players there who had really decent careers. Lee Chapman was still, what, 10 years off winning the title with Leeds, wasn't he? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Gavin probably remembers Heath and Bracewell fondly, but when Lee Chapman came to Arsenal, it was less successful, shall I say. But, but, but as you say, Chapman did go on to have a really good career. It's just, <laughs> unfortunately, the one club he found that was Arsenal, miserably. But. Yeah, he did, he did, if you think about it. With Sheffield Wednesday and Leeds, he was uh, he was quite. I mean, when Arsenal bought him, he was quite a source after talent, wasn't he? Yeah, Leeds he Arsenal. was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, eighty two was or something like that. You both bought some, some. Yeah, yeah, I think it was. Yeah, it was, I think it was a year after Frank Stobson left, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. They were desperately searching for a replacement, and um, unfortunately, <laughs> yeah, he joined Sheffield Wednesday as well, right? At some point. Yeah, he, he went to Sheffield no. Wednesday about eighty. From Arsenal was that Steve? You I, I think to. I think it yeah. was. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure he went. From Arsenal to Sheffield Wednesday, and then maybe Leeds after. I can't remember. Yeah, he, yeah, he, went I think to, so. he went to yeah. France for a bit as well, didn't he? I think. Oh yeah, yeah. That's a good. That's a good point. That yeah, he did play. Yeah. I can't remember what team he played for, but was oh, it New York? It was some weird team, wasn't yeah, it? Was it La Havre? I can't remember. Yeah, just, yeah, yeah. I just guess. Um, <laughs> as you say, you would you would have uh, big memories of Chapman. It's probably the only club that he really <laughs> yeah. failed at in the top flight of the four or five yeah. he was at. Yeah, sadly. <laughs> He did earn, I believe, B England caps, right? Yeah, he's never capped for the full team, right. you know. Uh, but he was he, on his day. He was he was a big striker. He, you know, with Leeds in the early nineties, he was he was he was excellent. Centre forward of his time, really, wasn't he? I don't, you don't see too many like that in the Premier League. No, these no, days. no. Now, I mean, he's a sort of centre forward that's disappeared in the modern game, wasn't he, Chapman? Yeah, yeah definitely. definitely yeah, I would yeah. say. I, I don't think there's many like him anymore. You know. Target man. Yeah. Next, we have another promoted side, Sunderland, managed by Ken Knight. The main transfer activities they brought in Big Sam Allardyce from Bolton in defense. Other players known in the team were Argentinian Claudio Marangoni, not many other standouts. Next, we come to Tottenham, managed by Keith Birkenshaw. They brought in Steve Archibald from Aberdeen, Garth Crooks from Stoke, and Graham Roberts from Weymouth. Players leaving included the likes of Colin Lee and Terry Naylor, who joined Charlton. So Tottenham also had a strong side. They had Chris Hewton, Ozzy Ardiles, Tony Galvin, Mickey Hazard, Glenn Hoddle, Steve Perriman, Ricardo Villa, Terry Yorath, Mark Falco, and Northern Ireland striker Jerry Armstrong. I think uh, if I remember rightly, the, the, the summer of eighty, it was it was this Tottenham sign and the two strikers, wasn't it? That was the main yeah. headline sort of transfer. I think they were expecting big things from. 
from Archibald and Crooks. Crooks again, I mean, he was at Stoke, wasn't he? Yes. Archibald had come down from just winning the title, I think, with, with Aberdeen, with, with Sir Alex. And I think the ones that, those are the two transfers that captured the imagination. And there was a lot of people looking forward to seeing them. Maybe Steve wasn't looking forward to seeing them. <laughs> no, Archibald, Archibald, yeah. Archibald tended to score against Arsenal, so that was a bit annoying, but... Um, yeah, yeah, they, they were both they, they were both uh, both fine players. They, they were always uh, in the early eighties, and we talk about this. But I always thought Birkenshaw was a really good manager. Yeah, he was. Yeah, really, yeah. you know, he never gets mentioned, but you see his record, particularly in cups at Spurs. Yeah, um, you know, won four years in the eighties, won first three trophies, three cups. Yeah. Invariably, they were high, always high up in the league, but they always ended up having to play about like two or three games a week from January <laughs> yeah. and February. But Birkenshaw's record is, at Tottenham is exceptional. He was the best manager he had, I think, between Bill Nicholson and Pochettino. I mean, you could argue he, he could actually won stuff, didn't he? But, <laughs> yeah. but yeah. yeah, Birkenshaw is one of them. He's, he's just, and he just disappeared from the game, didn't he? Yeah, it's strange. It was um, in the lead up sort of to the 1984 UEFA Cup final he kind of just announced he was going and it was just um, you know it was a good way to go out for them <laughs> um, yeah but I mean, he still had a good team then I mean he did yeah in his second or third the following year and it was, it was just straight I mean he had this thing didn't he the famous quote from him about there used to be a football club over <laughs> there remember yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is, because then he floated on the stock exchange hadn't he yeah, yeah. I think Scholar was the, the team and I think Spurs one of the first clubs to become to become a limited company. And they, they did they spent a lot of money on one of their stands as well, didn't they? I remember. Yeah, yeah, a bit that was like Chelsea and yeah, 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 yeah. The one opposite the the shelf. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 I mean th- th- this is one of the things, you know, that that's worth talking about, I think, when we always look at English football in the early eighties. There was a lot of club. There was, there was several clubs in the seventies who built big stands. You know, like Wolves did, Nottingham yeah. Forest did, didn't he? Chelsea, did. Chelsea. It, yeah, at a time yeah. when you know you had decent gates. By the early eighties, yeah. they had all this debt to pay for the stands, and they didn't have people coming through the uh, the turnstiles. I mean, there's a few Forest fans who say that. Sean, you said about them sort of drifting away after eighty. There's a few Forest fans who say that actually they lost it because they built up, they put all the big the new stand in it. Well, yeah, I, I wrote, I wrote, a, I wrote a piece about Ipswich when um, Bobby Robson left in 1982, and that they built a stand as well. Um, yeah, I think they spent 1.5 million pounds, which was obviously a lot back. A lot back of money, then. yeah, yeah, yeah. And and then, like you say, because the attendances were going down, and because Ipswich were sort of dropping slightly from the Bobby Robson standards, they weren't qualifying for Europe, and then. I think they were called the team that built a stand and then got relegated, or something along those lines. Yeah, <laughs> um, but. It's interesting going back to the Tottenham signings as well. Graham Roberts, you, you don't tend to get players coming straight from non-league nowadays, do you? To the Premier League, as, as far as I can remember. I know Vardy went via Fleetwood, but yeah, yeah. Since I mean, I, don't, I can't. To be fair, I can't remember many players then. No, <laughs> off like from from non-league, you know. And, 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 and to be fair, Graham made a pretty great impression straight away, didn't he? Really, he did. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think of any others. Maybe I, I know Sue. Sue Regis might have come straight yeah. from non league. I, think, I, I can't remember. Pierce did, didn't he? Yeah, Pierce. Oh, and Devonshire. So you know yeah. Devonshire. Yeah. 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 I think Pierce, Pierce certainly went from non league. Later on, Ian Knight went from non league, didn't he? To yeah, great. Perhaps, but they weren't in the tough yeah. flight then, were they? They were, you know, they were down second division. Yeah. yeah. In terms of tough flights, yeah, there'll be, be very few. I mean, Jimmy Case in Liverpool in the mid-70s went from South Liverpool to Liverpool. That's slightly oh. different because you're in the same city, you know? Yeah, yeah. But, the, yeah, it, it was something that was unusual. But he was a, he was a, he was a good player, Graham Roberts, and he was, he was not necessarily what you call a Spurs player in some respect. No. He, he, um, he, did tough, put Charlie, he? he did put Charlie Nicholas over an advertising on board once in a North London derby. But, um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So well, he's not he very popular. Tough. <laughs> yeah, he was tough as tough as tough as old boots, Graham Roberts. To be fair, I always remember him scoring two own goals against Burnley in the quarter final of the League Cup, which was quite amusing. But <laughs> <laughs> he yeah. also he also fell out with Graham Souness at Rangers. So that's ah yeah 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 <laughs> yeah. But I bet you, I bet you discussions between them two would, would be interesting because <laughs> I, don't, I don't think neither of them will give an inch, would they? In a, in a confrontation, you know, on and off the pitch. No. But yeah, he was he was a good player, Graham Roberts. I think 
Spurs needed a couple more like him. I always thought in the in in the early eighties. I mean, the one one player I've not mentioned from Tottenham, I I think, is one of the best uncapped England players is uh, Mickey Hazard. Oh, okay, yeah. I thought I thought Hazard was a tremendous player. You know, never got capped by England. Real midfield craftsman, overshadowed a little bit by RD Les and Glenn Hoddle. I thought I thought he was a you know he was a tremendous player. He should have been capped. There's far far worse players than him. <laughs> <laughs> 20 England caps in the centre of the park. Me yeah, was, I, I always argue about um, I always argue that Paul Davis of Arsenal should have had a cap as well, like you yeah, say. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, got, yeah. I was going to say no disrespect, but no disrespect to the likes of Colt and Palmer that, that, for them to get loads of caps. And yeah, Paul Davis, Paul Davis was a tremendous player. I mean, he'd he play now, Paul Davis. He'd be ideal in the modern game, wouldn't he? He would. He would. I think yeah. Paul Davis, you know, you, you see. See players like him, the Premier League flourishing. I don't think I think Davis busted his copybook with the, the, the Glenn Cockrell thing, didn't he? Where he, he did. Flaxed, broke his jaw, didn't he, on the pitch? He did, yeah. He was on the news later on in the decade, wasn't it? But he, uh, yeah. yeah, he was he was a top player, Paul Davis. Yeah, you see some of the play. Yeah, I thought he was better to Carlton Barb. He's nowhere on a patch on Paul <laughs> Davis, isn't he? he got nah, exactly. 15, 20 England caps. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, that's a whole different discussion. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Next, we get to West Bromwich Albion, managed by Ron Atkinson. Again, not major transfer activity there, but they had the likes of Derek Statham, Remy Moses, Gary Owen, Brian Robson, Peter Barnes, John Dean, and Cyril Regis, among others. This would be Ron Atkinson's final season before joining Man U, as well as Brian Robson, who would join early in the following season. Yeah, that, so, that's, a, that, that's a strong team. I think they were probably, I think Ron left at the right time, didn't he? But West Brom, I think that team, the late 70s, was just beginning to maybe pass the peak. But some, some tremendous players there. One player you mentioned there, I think, if you talk about. Players who never got well, there's good reason for it. Is Derek Statham was an absolute top class left back, wasn't he? He got a handful of caps in 1983 when it toured Australia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you yeah. mentioned Kenny Sanson early on. It was the, it was the reason it was Kenny Sanson, wasn't it? But yeah. in in another era, Derek Statham would have had a reasonably long international career and pretty yeah. confident off. I know Ron Atkinson said he. With no bias, so I was on tour the other week, and he said he felt at one stage Eric Statham was the best left back on the planet. Yeah. Um, but which is a big shout, but he was he was top class, Derek Statham, and in different ways, one of one easy one forty, fifty, sixty England caps, right. very good player. Finally, we get to the final team: Wolverhampton Wanderers, managed by John Barnwell. Again, not much transfer activity. But the uh, significant players were Welsh player George Berry, Emlyn Hughes in the veteran stage of his career, and Andy Gray. Let's get to the season itself. The charity shield was on August 9th between Liverpool and West Ham, who were actually in the then second division. They had won the FA Cup, and in fact, they would be competing in the Cup Winners' Cup as a second division side. So Liverpool won that match 1-0 from a Terry McDermott goal. The proper season started the following week on August 16th. From the early going, Ipswich had the lead from late August to late October. We discussed what a good team they were they would also do well in Europe that we'll discuss later on. The first managerial casualty of the season was Leeds' James Adamson, who resigned on September 28th. He'd be replaced for like a few days by Dave Merrington before Alan Clark would take charge in October 6th. The once great leads were on a downward spiral and they would continue into the next season. As far as um, this early going, what do you remember about Ipswich's dominance? I think Ipswich, 80, you have to go back to the previous season. I think they'd struggled before Christmas and then they went on a really long unbeaten run, I think, in the league from 
Christmas 79. I think they lost the last game of the season. I think Man City. So I think at the start of the season, they were hardly fancy the switch. You've mentioned the team there. It names itself, doesn't it? And they were definitely seen as as a team who were uh, you know could win the title. Uh, but Liverpool were also. So Liverpool was a bit of a funny season, I think. A little bit in transition. Maybe not as strong as normal. But that Ipswich team was top notch. I mean, I can't remember Villa really being mentioned. You know, they had a decent team. But I can't remember them being mentioned as potential champions in, in 80. But Ipswich, Ipswich definitely. I think Southampton were fancied as well because obviously they bought Keegan and they'd had a, a good record over a couple of seasons. But yeah, Ipswich was Ipswich were good. I mean, Steve, would Arsenal would have been mentioned as well, I would imagine, wouldn't he? I think Arsenal were fancied by some pundits, but the, the sale of Liam Brady was obviously a, a huge blow to our chances. Yeah, and, and then actually the signing of Clive Allen would have been quite interested, a bit, you know, a bit of extra firepower, but then they replaced him with Kenny Sansom. But going back to like Ipswich, I think they went 15 games unbeaten at the start of the season. And as you said, they'd had that great run at the, the end of the previous season. But strangely, in a way, maybe the Aston Villa getting knocked out of the FA Cup by Ipswich later on in the season benefited them because they only used 14 players famously, didn't they? But, yeah. Yes. yeah, yeah. It's, it's interesting, you know, you meant you're going through the squads there, Sean, at the start of the show. And if you if you do the oldest game of football and combine, get a combined Ipswich and Villa team from that season, how many Villa players would get in? I don't think many would, would they? Mm, if any. No, no. You know, even though Villa, Villa and Ipswich ended up going head to head, which wasn't that, you know, but Villa were up there from the start, I think. But when, you know, Ipswich is a fancy team. When you look at the two teams on paper and pick the best 11, there's not many players getting in. The individual quality was was with Ipswich. What I think Villa had was a tougher core of players, weren't they? I think they were mentally more resilient. I always felt with Ipswich, you know, and, and this comes out later in the, in the season, I think, in 80-81, is I think they just lacked application, you know, in the really big games. Do you think they season. Do you think they ran out of steam as well, though? Because they I did think, have 66, did, but, was it 66 games? Yeah, oh. yeah. But at the start of the season, like, they were, they were, really, they were really good. I think they, had, they, they got beat at Brighton, didn't they, I think? Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. Brighton be fair. I think I'm not sure whether Brighton the only teams to beat them both both of them during the season, you know, at the dome ground. But yeah, it was it was an interesting campaign because early on Liverpool just didn't seem like Liverpool. They got beat at Leicester. They lost in the League Cup early, one of the first leg, one the second leg, and they were they were quite quite clearly a team in transition. If you you know obviously being Liverpool, you get the the, the old Saturday pink hat <laughs> newspapers. And the AC81 campaign was filled with letters, you know, angry of Liverpool, even though they've just won six titles in eight years. <laughs> Saying, you know, whether Paisley was the man to take them forward. And they'll beat Wolves 4-1, as, as mad as it sounds. So uh, quite early on, I think this is why, this is one of my favourite seasons, really. It's quite early on. It, it looked like a, a season that English football had not had for about 10 years, where it was quite open. Unless Ipswich really carried on their turbo charge finish, it was going to be a, a really close run thing. But they they, they were just a just a superb team to watch, weren't they? Ipswich, the the two Dutch lads. Yeah. And you know, and I, I know it's been said before, but they had a uh, Eric Gates was one of the first players, wasn't he, to play in that hole behind the two players, yeah, wasn't yeah. he? Yeah. That nobody's really seen that sort of position. Somebody play in that position before and and I think this was the Terry Butter started became a really good centre half this season. I think he might have been capped by England for the first time, and that that, that partnership we had with Russell Osman. But they were they were great individual players, but they were still like a great team as well. Yeah, yeah. And Bobby was obviously a great manager, but you know Ron Saunders was a a top top manager. You know, sadly. You know, very underrated. He sadly died to me about 12 months ago. I mean, where would you put them? I was just wanted to make you pet them, Steve. If you say that over that 70s to early 80s period in English football, you put Paisley and Clough, obviously, as the top two, but you put Robson and Saunders yeah. probably the next two best, wouldn't you? 
I yeah, I definitely, I definitely put Robson up there. Obviously, Sa- Saunders, <laughs> Saunders did win the league, so yeah. Um, and I, and I think he's often kind of a forgotten manager, really. Yeah. In in terms of you know he, he won the league and he got Villa to the quarter final the European Cup before he resigned or was sacked or yeah. Um, and and obviously Tony Barton kind of took over his team and ended up winning the European Cup. But yeah, I think he is definitely a forgotten manager. I think in the seventies he reached three League Cup finals. Yeah, he won. He won a couple. He won a couple, didn't he? Yeah, uh, yeah. seventy-five, seventy-seven. Yeah, because I think he, he did. Didn't he do three in four years or something? Didn't he? City? Yeah, there was, was people forget him. Clubs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was at City, wasn't he, for a while? Which people forget Saunders. Yeah, um, exactly. But I feel like he did his best work, and I, I thought he was a he was a mentally tough manager. Oh yeah, I think you wouldn't have crossed him definitely. But <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't. I mean, <laughs> as this podcast was saying about like Ron Atkinson say said the both him said there, you wouldn't be the type of person to want to go on holiday with. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> and, uh, and I know exactly where he's coming from there. Uh, yeah. You know, but yeah, it, it was it, it was Rich and Villa were the two two teams of season and both managed by you know exceptional. Yeah. Exceptional, but very, very different characters. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. You could say, and and, that, and 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 in some respects, that was reflected in their teams, weren't right, they? Yeah, uh, definitely. Yeah. But going back to it, Ipswich just made a really good start. But Villa were up there from the start. So they did make a late late run. They were they, they were there thereabouts all season. Echoing uh, Stephen's earlier point about Ipswich playing too many games, that's exactly what Bobby Robson believed, and we'll get to it at the end of the season because that's yeah. that's what he said made the difference between the teams, as in the late run. Doing my research, I came across this um, humorous incident in the second league match, Crystal Palace and Tottenham. Vince Hilaire was sent off for pushing match referee Alf Gray. After pushing him, he apologized saying that he thought he was pushing Garth Crooks. So. <laughs> <laughs> pick, pick, the, pick the bones out of that one. You know what I thought you were going to say there, Sean, for the instance? This is the, the, the notorious South Crystal Palace instance is this season, isn't it? <laughs> at the start of this campaign, the, the, yeah. the away game at Coventry City, where uh, famously Clive Allen, who's a sort of recurring theme in this podcast, <laughs> Was, was it was it a free kick, Steve, or was it a it shot? Was, I think I think someone tapped a free kick to him, if I remember yeah. right. and he, yeah. he smashed it to the top corner, and it it went, it went in, obviously. Um, well, I say obviously, the ref didn't spot it, but <laughs> so it yeah, hit the back stanchion, didn't it? It, did. it hit the back stanchion and then came back out again, didn't it? But it quite clearly went over the line, uh, and Phoenix. everybody bothered the, the linesman and the, the referee didn't give it, you know. They did, and it's no story. Pardon. Yeah. Sorry, they did a Phoenix from the Flames on fantasy football a few years back. Oh, did they? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was, it was yeah. Quite amusing, but. If, if you, if, there's a great bit clip if you have watched the match today on that, which is relevant to the modern game. And Jimmy Hill starts going off in Jimmy, Jimmy Hill style about yeah. it. And he starts saying about the referee's decision has to be final. If yeah. you take the decision out of the referee's hands at the game, then chaos will ensue. Well, it's funny, <laughs> you know, I, it, in my research, I, I found a, a quote from Terry Venable saying he didn't want to use TV recordings to decide decisions, but he said there should be some kind of magic eye like they had at Wimbledon with the, the side. Yeah. Track. So he kind of sounds like he wanted gold on technology, but not VAR. So. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But it was interesting. It was, it was one of today be given, wouldn't it? And it it's still yeah. remembered, even now, 40 years later. Yeah, yeah. You know, if you mention Clive Allen's name, that's immediately, of a certain age, that is immediately the incident you recall. Strangely enough, there was a Bundesliga game about, he was commentating on BT Sports about seven years ago. The same thing happened in a Bayer Leverkusen game and he was he was co-commentating. So it was it was quite apt that he was, uh, yeah. he was talking about it, you know, but that was notorious. But I've never heard that hilarious story. Yeah, yeah. I've never heard that. It's, it's astonishing, isn't it? It was in uh, France Football Magazine for that week and I just came across it. And I yeah. thought it was pretty funny. <laughs> Chris, I know we're talking about, but we need to talk about Palace that year because they had, was it four managers or something? Yes. Had, in fact, uh, months, we come to the month of October and we have a couple of managerial changes. First, we have Malcolm Allison is sacked at Man City. He'd be replaced by John Bond, who was a manager of Norwich. 
at the same time, Ken Brown would replace John Bond at Norwich. The same month, Terry Venables, he quit Crystal Palace to take over at second division QPR, Queen's Park Rangers, who had sacked Tommy Doherty. We previously mentioned Alan Clark also taking charge at Leeds. So there were many managerial changes this month. As far as Malcolm Allison's situation, Paul, what do you remember in that early going for Man City? Well, he'd been, um, he'd been very successful in the late 60s, early 70s. He wasn't officially the manager. Joe Mercer was officially the manager, but it was basically Malcolm Allison was in charge of the, the team, the tactics. So he'd returned in the late 70s. Uh, City hadn't had a great time of it, and he, he made a lot of changes in a very short space of time. Uh, we've mentioned Steve Daly at the time, the most expensive player in English football. It was one of his signings. Steve McKenzie as well, he spent a lot on. And he just couldn't get this this team to gel in their start to the season, uh, which can be seen in the, the City documentary that, that you've mentioned. Had a really bad start to the season. And I think Peter Swales, the chairman, had given him a couple of games to, to save his job. He lost those and, and he was out. And he never really, um, he had a brief spell at Crystal Palace the same season as, as we've mentioned. And that was more or less it for English football. I think he went to Sporting Lisbon after that. Um, but he's someone that's always mentioned as one of the sort of tactical innovators in English football and also introducing a more professional approach, looking at diet, uh, training in, in a lot more detail than he'd done in the late 60s, early 70s. But this season and, and that documentary sort of cemented his reputation as the, quite a flamboyant figure and it just didn't work out for him at, at Man City. And it also has this sort of subplot of John Bond, who he'd known for decades. The, the two of them have quite a difficult relationship and Alison had made various comments about Bond, you know, not being a great manager, not really having achieved anything. So obviously gave John Bond a lot of motivation when he, when he took his job. I mean, we must, I know you mentioned it, but that City documentary, it's an extraordinary bit of television, isn't it, for the start? Never mind football, it's just an extraordinary bit of television. And, I mean, I've watched it several times. There was, there was a bit of, they were in a bit of trouble, you know, that there was some stuff that, like, they shouldn't have broadcast, that they weren't allowed to. But at the time, if I remember, but it's just, it's just fantastic television and... Compare and contrast to today's sort of glossy sheen ever efforts. It's 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 real chalk and cheese, and I I, I love watching it because it's, it's fantastic Italian and the the the, the subplots are, are great, as you say. That the fact that it's Bond. I mean, they didn't know that. I mean, well, when they started filming it, they didn't know Alison was going to be sacked because they're obviously filming it from the start of the eighty eighty one season. And then when he gets sacked to point Bond, you know, yeah. the likes of Amazon had killed for that subplot, <laughs> wouldn't he, really? You know what I mean? Yeah. I think, I think Bond said, didn't, didn't he say that Alison called him a country bumpkin or something? Was the, yeah. Uh, yeah in so. it, you know, and it's obviously, though they said they claimed to be close friends, I don't think that was necessarily the case. And it, it, it's, it's, it's an incredible hour of television. I mean, there's so many memorable moments that I wouldn't know where to start. I mean... The one I always remember the, is was where the, the film and Bond's interview for the role, aren't they? Yeah, that's brilliant. Yeah, that's brilliant television. Uh, you know, and it's it's it the, and it's Peter Swales in the in the interview, isn't it? He's flicking the matchbox up and <laughs> across the table in an interview. He's just sitting there bored off his head, you know. <laughs> and there's that, and I think you know the famous bit, which I think is being where, where Alison says goodbye to the players, which is quite sad. Yeah. Yeah. And you can you can just say he's I won't say he's fallen apart, but he, well he is, isn't he? He's fallen yeah. apart, isn't he, in the job? It was just incredible. I mean, th- there's so many fantastic bits in it. You know, the dressing room pieces are, are incredible before and after games. And when they go I think they get beat at Leeds, don't they? And you know the game's up and you go into the dressing room, it's just complete lots of silence, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And, couple a couple of takeaways that I had. The scene where he's answering to journalists, you see the journalists, they're all these crusty old veterans, old style newspaper men, 
And yeah. today, the media aspect is very much a younger man's game, I would say. Yeah. And the other thing where you mentioned where at the training pitch, he announces his resignation and he shakes hands one by one with the first team squad. If that had been done today, and it's basically, I would say, maybe 20 some odd players. And if this was done today, just his backroom and coaching staff would be in that many people. Mm-hmm. And the yeah. playing staff would be like 45. Like, but it shows how at the time the teams were much smaller. You just had a core of 20 some odd first team players. Yeah. And that's kind of the one thing that did, stood out. Did, there's another curiosity about it as well for me. Is Dennis Stewart's not in it, is he? I at didn't all. notice. And he was at City at the time. He's a bright fella, Dennis. And I'm just wondering whether he actually agreed <laughs> to, to cooperate with getting filmed because he's not in it at all. Not even when. It's, it's when I love it. There's so many things. Like when, when Bond's doing his uh, introductory talk and he says about, you know, you've got to call me gaffer for this <laughs> rather tenuous reason that there might be other Johns around at the time when you, you know, or, or boss or whatever he says. He says right, right, boss, boss, yeah. Because if you've called me John, there may be other Johns in the room and people would be wondering what you're saying. I was just thinking, <laughs> that's just nonsense, you know what I mean? And it's just, uh, and it goes on the rules, doesn't it? But it's, just, it's just fabulous telly. Again, that get that great end story as well, where Palace and City get thrown together in the FA Cup, where, as you say, Alisson's oh, now yes. gone to, to Palace and he play in the, I think it's the third round, isn't it? They were, they were extremely uh, lucky, weren't they, to get... To, to one, get the sacking of Allison during the programme, and two, then he's replaced by Bond, and then three, Bond faces him in the FA Cup third round. But he's, you know, yeah. it's I, I, amazing. I'd make road as well. I'd, if it had been the yeah. Park, it wouldn't have been as... No, it wouldn't have been as good. Park wouldn't have been there, would it? It's, when, it's, it's yeah. that main road, isn't it? So he's back. Yeah. It just, I don't know. They couldn't have scripted it. That's no, 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 no. So, you must have just think, thought, or just get like, you know, three or four months of Alison at City. Yeah. And, and it became this like wonderful like story of like different <laughs> plot lines. And, and it was just a, it was just a fabulous bit of telly that as an age at all, if you, no. there's, there's also a good point, Steve, isn't it? If you have a look when there's, there's young Clive Hills, they commentating, isn't he? Yes. Yeah. Because yeah, he, yeah, yeah. he was working for local radio in Liverpool at the time. Yeah, yeah, and uh, Liverpool were playing City at Main Road. Main Road yeah, and uh, you know when he pans around the stands, there's a there's a young uh, young Clive Hills <laughs> commentating, uh, which is always good to watch. And uh, Eddie yeah. Hemmings is there, who later became the, ah, the face of uh, face of rugby league on Sky Sports because Eddie Hemmings was working with Radio Merseyside at the time. And it's just you could you could do a whole podcast on the City documentary, <laughs> couldn't you? Really, you know. Yeah. But it was just, it was just, it was just. Did you any any other memorable moments for you, Steve? That we've not covered. Just, I, uh, I think, I think you hinted at it. Uh, but, mm-hmm. but the the one bit that really struck me is how sad I felt for Alison when he he was just sat in the dressing room in silence, staring blankly. You know, just thinking, I I, I can't do anything to turn this ship around, yeah. and. It was just, but yeah, like you say, just every, just just the, the job interview with John Bond is just brilliant. The, the yeah, when he comes in, and says you can call me Gaffer or Boss or whatever he says, yeah. and then and you kind of think he turns it round at the start, doesn't he, John Bond? And yeah, they, yeah. they obviously we, we'll discuss it later. They they get to the cup final, but like within a couple of years, it's just unravelled again, and you, and and City is sort of heading back to the second division, and it's. It, it was just obviously before before the shakes turned up. It was just a mad club man city, wasn't it? Really? Yeah, yeah. It, it it was a typical city production, wasn't it? Really? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But oh yeah, it, it's just it's just you know anybody who's listened to this podcast who's never never seen it, you know, <laughs> in, I think it's city exclamation mark you have to it type is. in, isn't it? Uh, it is. to watch it's, it on on the internet. Brilliant. And if you've never, I mean, you don't have to have been around at the time to appreciate no. it. There's a good university study there, isn't it? Dissertation on contrast <laughs> that to today's uh, club documentaries, you know. But uh, it's just it's just wonderful, wonderful stuff. Yeah. As far as other news in the month of October, you had some transfers. Andy Ritchie leaving Man United and joining Brighton. You had Israeli defender Jacob Cohen from Hapoel Beersheba joining Brighton. Striker Peter Ward left Brighton and joined Nottingham Forest. Tommy Hutchison, 
left Coventry and joined Man City. Alan Curtis, he left Leeds and joined Swansea. Jerry Armstrong left Tottenham and joined Watford. But the significant transfer of the month was Gary Birdles on the outs at Nottingham Forest joining Man United. Apparently, he had personal problems with Brian Cloth. He had wanted to leave for some time. And I read, and I'll have to take it with you guys if you know if this is true. The root of a problem stemmed from the fact that he had requested a few days off for, for his move. But uh, Brian Clough had refused to grant him those few days. And that's how the rift started between the two. Is that just a story or any factual basis to it or... No, I'm not sure. I mean, he'd no, wanted sure. to move for a while, hadn't he, Bertles, I think, he did for a couple of months when he went. You know, I tell you what, I've heard that before, personal problems with Brian Clough. <laughs> 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 but he, he, he sort of stalled a little bit in his development, hadn't he, Stephen? Paul? I think so. I, I, think, yeah. gen- I think generally Forrest had kind of stalled a bit, hadn't they? Because... Yeah. We're in October and they went out to CSKA Sophia. I've got them a note. So yes, yeah. yes. To kind of end their European run. The signings, you know, they're bringing in like Peter Wardy and Wallace, Justin Fashion, who later next season, they, they, they didn't really work. And Francis was injured too around this time. Francis, yeah, Francis was injured. Peter Shilton was starting to have personal issues away from the game. When yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we won't well, go to that, that in a moment. That was, wasn't his first game after that. That was at Arsenal, wasn't Arsenal, it? Arsenal, yeah, yeah. They were, yeah. Singing some songs towards him about that, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, but obviously, Bertels is kind of remembered at Man United as a bit of a disaster. I can't remember how many games he took. Was it over 40 games he took to score? I can't yeah, remember. Yeah, it, it was mad, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure he, did he score in the league that season? He might have scored yeah. in the FA Cup. Yeah, or... I mean, I'm not sure because it kind of became a sort of um, how he could would start comparing transfers. You'd say, mm. you know, will he be like a Gary Bertels at Man United or? A cautionary yeah. tale of a bad exactly. transfer, I guess. Yeah, because yeah. he did yeah. go back to he went back to Forest eventually, didn't he? I think. Yeah, and he had a decent career in his second spell, but he never really fulfilled. I mean, in his first year of Forest, first eighteen months, he was excellent, but then oh, he, he was yeah. nailed off. But as you say, Steve, you say Forest were tailing off, weren't they? Then they and were a little bit, yeah, yeah. And then that, the relationship between um, sort of Clough and Taylor started to come a little bit strained as well. I think. Yeah, then, because I tell you why, that was the year Taylor's book came out. It was, wasn't it? Yeah, which, yeah. But yeah. Which was which was the part of the division between them because I don't think Clough knew he was writing it, did he or something? I don't think he did, no, yeah. no. And Taylor's book came out, which is very good, but I think that sort of started the, yeah. the source and of then, the between the two. Yeah. Later down the line, obviously Taylor, because he he said I want to retire because I'm getting too old, and then he ended up at Derby, and then he ended up signing John Robertson behind oh, Clough's which, back. And, yeah. Which is for another pause, isn't it? Because you, it is, it is. Right, yeah, but, yeah. That's ten yeah. podcasts, I would think. That's <laughs> Taylor Clough, <laughs> so. yeah, Taylor Clough, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> but the yeah, they say so I forgot about Peter Ward. They've been hardly sourced off at of Brighton, hadn't they, for a, for a while, for a number of years. Yeah, and uh, not another one had not fulfilled his potential. He's another one that I had mentioned that Australia trip. I think Peter Ward. He got capped in Australia, I think. It yeah, him, him, him and Alan Sunderland got one cap, I think, yeah. in that 1980 game against Australia. I think, but, yeah, um, Alan Sunderland was a good player, though, to be yeah. fair. Yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, so management moves started happening that October. But yeah, didn't you see what Bond bought in? Didn't he bought in Tommy Utterson? Yeah. Bought in Jerry Gow, didn't he, from Bristol City? Brought in yeah. Phil Boy, who would have had at Norwich, you would imagine, and Bournemouth as well. Phil Boy was at, wasn't he? I think he would have had. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Them. So he started bringing a few old hands in that he'd, he'd worked with previously. Bonds. Yeah. And as you say, he, he sort of t- he turned it around pretty much straight away. Yeah. Um, yeah. City. But yeah, it was, it was. And then he signed, obviously, well, this is covered in the documentary. He ends up signed <laughs> Kevin, doesn't he? Kevin yes. Bond. Yeah. Which was covered in the documentary brilliantly. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So City tends to start to turn around on the jump on. And before we get to November, we should mention that Man City won their first match of the season at their 13th attempt on October 22nd when they beat Tottenham. We come to November. A couple of uh, items to discuss. 
Aston Villa actually were league leaders for like a couple of weeks in November. But obviously, each switch would take over again later in the month. Interestingly, I learned that, that in early November, Ernie Wally, who was managing Crystal Palace, he dropped Clive Allen and Vince Hilaire. And his reasoning was that Allen has scored one goal in 10 matches and Hiller is out of form. Their troubles continued. Another interesting point, Tony Gooden, the goalkeeper of West Bromwich Albion, he played in his 82nd straight match, which um, I don't know if it's a record at the club at the time, but it was significant. Ipswich would lose their first match of the season in their 15th match on November 11th when they lost 1-0 to Brighton. Some transfer for this month, Gary Howlett joined Coventry from Drum Condra. Later in the month, David Watson, the younger David Watson, the one who would eventually join Everton, he left Liverpool and joined Norwich. While Phil Boyer left Southampton and joined Man City. Yeah, the, the Dave Watson transfer is an interesting one um, for the simple reason that he'd only been a professional six weeks at yeah. Liverpool. He played for Liverpool reserves. I've been told that actually the, the scouts went to look. You mentioned Richard Money was at Liverpool, then went to look at Richard Money, uh, Norwich, and then yeah. they, they, they seen Dave Watson at, and they went with Dave Watson. It was quite an interesting deal. Dave Watson, I think, was 18 or 19. Not play for Liverpool, but there was a clause in his contract that if he played for England while he was at while he was at Norwich, that Liverpool would get another hundred thousand pound, which he did. Yeah, which because he he made his debut in the famous game in Brazil when John Barnes scored that goal. So that just shows you how he was regarded. I think within Anfield that they want that clause in. They thought that obviously there may be a potential England player there. And it just shows that the centre of Liverpool at the time that actually they'd let a player like Watson go. Because you would have had like Thompson, Hansen still there. But Lawrence later on in the following year. And it was a smart move by Liverpool to get that close in a contract <laughs> on internationals for somebody who was still in, in the reserves being professional six weeks. Incest yeah. and uh, transfer that. Other transfers that month, Pat Rice left Arsenal, joined Watford. Malcolm Page left Birmingham, joined Oxford. Terry Venables signed Terry Fennick from Crystal Palace for QPR. It would not be the first time that he would do this, signing Terry Fennick. Kazimierz Dana, the Polish star, he left Man City to join San Diego Soccers in the United States. Obviously, he was one of the best players of his generation, but he had two disappointing seasons at Man City and he just wanted to get away. Jimmy Greenhoff left Man United and joined Crew, and Claudio Marangoni left Sunderland and English football and joined Huracan in Argentina. Then we get to the month of December. We talk about best on cap players. You put Jimmy Greenhoff in there, wouldn't you? I think, Steve. Cool. Yeah, yeah, definitely Jimmy Greenoff. Yeah, as, as we discussed, Paul Davis, yeah, Mickey Hazard's a good, good shout. A bit later on, Steve Bruce, I guess, people like that. Yeah, yeah. It, Billy Bronze. Amazing, Billy, Billy Bronze, yeah. It's amazing yeah. in the modern era just how many people seem to get capped and with all these ridiculous friendlies. Yeah. And... It, it, it's harder not to get capped now, isn't it, really? <laughs> it is, I think, mean, yeah. Playing the Premier League. But, yeah, Jimmy, Jimmy Greenoff was a tremendous player. He'd be right there at the very top of players who've not been capped by England, you know, the yeah, top definitely. three or four. He was a real, really classy striker, really smart, really clever, absolute top top of the range player. How he never got an England cap is, is beyond <laughs> me, to be fair. But he was, uh, yeah, he was. He'd been injured, hadn't he, at night, as I think that I think that effectively ended his career. But yeah, he was top top of the range, Jimmy Jimmy Greenoff. Yeah. Yeah. And I do also, I do the one that mentioned there is he had a very fine career after he left United. Charles mentioned there, he was Andy Ritchie going to yeah. Brighton. He ended up having a long, long and successful career at Brighton. Did he go to Leeds then? And obviously, his. Yeah, I think he played for Leeds, yeah. Yeah, his best days were obviously Oldham. Oldham, yeah, I remember yeah. His, that Oldham team was pretty good too. <laughs> yeah, at the end of the 80s. But Andy Ritchie was a similar type of player. 
clever. He was a, he was top top drawer as well, but he had a good career after leaving United. Yeah, I think a lot of Man United fans were a little surprised that he was um, kind of sacrificed to bring Bertels in. I think he might have only been still a teenager at the time and obviously had a yeah. lot, of, lot of potential. And as it worked out really with the Bertels deal, they, they, they might have regretted that one. Yeah, there was that old joke about that, reminds you of Gary Bales. I think, they, remember the American Oxages were released in, it was January 81 at Tehran, that was like what the first words were, like Gary Bale score for Man United, yeah, you know, <laughs> being, in, being in captivity for 18 months, you know, <laughs> but, but uh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, you could see why, because I think he he sort of broke through the previous year, hadn't he, Richie, he's got that again, Spurs on match of the day, he would have been useful for him, I think, in the early 80s. Yeah, very good play. We get to December. Malcolm Allison is appointed as Crystal Palace manager. That would end badly as well. The year ends with Liverpool just leading on goal difference ahead of Villa. Ipswich are behind, but they do have two games in hand. Even still, at this point, they were the most consistent team in the league going into the new year. Another news report I came across was that Mario Kempes was linked to Nottingham Forest. But uh, Brian Clough, he said that agents throw out names like confetti. It's out of the question. <laughs> There's a bit later on in the season, there was a, a big link with Johan Cruyff going to Leicester. Yeah. Um, I, yeah that, and, they, <laughs> and it was reported that he was going to be getting £4,000 a game to go to Leicester. But that fell through at the last minute, I think. So, yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a... Dramatic. Um, if, if Johan Cruyff had played for Leicester, that would have been superb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, did they, there was always ones like that, wasn't there? A bit yeah. remember the uh, Maradona was Maradona Mar- to Arsenal. Yeah. Yeah. Arsenal was that was yeah. that was one. But yeah, yeah. They, with all due respect to Leicester, you know Johan Cruyff. Yeah, you know, Maradona to Arsenal. You can make that work, can you? In some yeah, days. possibly. Right, but Johan yeah. Cruyff to Leicester doesn't make a lot of sense, to be fair. <laughs> but it was, I say, it was, it was. It wasn't just idle gossip, was it? No, no, it was very close, apparently. But he went to—I think he went to Spain in the end. But yeah, well, yeah, that—that that was a being that, that, that uh, yeah, Juan Cruyff and Gary Lineker up front. That was <laughs> Gary Lineker, but yeah, yeah Leicester was struggling, man. I think that year. Yeah, they were. Yeah, but they, they did getting on to January eighty-one. They did produce one of the great shocks of the. Oh yeah, the Liverpool. The yeah. Oh yeah. yes, yes. Leicester, Liverpool not being beaten at Anfield for 85 games. Right. Leicester go there, bottom of the table, getting beat 1 0, come back to win 2 yeah. 2 1. Yeah. It was funny, you know, there's that weird stat, isn't it? I think the three longest home runs in English football have all been ended by a team by the bottom of the table at the time. Yeah. You, know when Brighton, you know, when Brighton beat Forest? Ah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The time when Forest hadn't lost since they come up, had they? Yeah. Brighton were bottom of the table, weren't they? And when, you know, Mourinho's long record that Chelsea where he'd not lost at home, that yeah. went against Sunderland, didn't it? When yeah. Gus Poyer was the manager, I think, Chelsea, I think they were bottom of the table as well. Oh, OK, yeah. But yeah, the eight, January 81, I said before, that was when the... What happened in 81 with Liverpool is one of the big games, you know this, Steve, yourself, big game in the league that season was when Liverpool go to Villa Park, don't they? Yeah, yes. yes, on in this month of January, yeah. on January 10th, Aston Villa moved to the top after they beat Liverpool 2-0. Other news in this month, Ian Boyer left Nottingham Forest and joined Sunderland. We mentioned uh, Tony Cotton as an 18-year-old made his debut for Birmingham versus Sunderland and actually saved a penalty kick. Also, Dave Sexton at Man United, he placed Sammy McElroy in reserves as he was struggling. And another piece of news, Kevin McNally, who was a former referee, in the Sun newspaper, he caused some controversy when he called Kevin Keegan king of the divers. (laughs) And we already mentioned Everton eliminating Liverpool in the FA Cup. Also, Man City defeated Norwich 6-0. This was John Bond's first match as Man City manager against his former club, Norwich. No, I was going to say, 
Because like Liverpool had a bad month, they obviously got beat by Villa in a big top of the table clash, knocked out the FA Cup by Everton, and then they, they lose at home to Leicester. We're talking about Tony Coton. Is we talk about best uncapped players? I mean, yeah. he'd probably be the best uncapped England keeper, wouldn't he? I but, think so. And and did Dennis Mortimer? Because I'm thinking of that Villa game. Dennis Mortimer scored that. No, he? Dennis uh, Mortimer never got a cap. He, he never got a cap either. Did he? So that's another yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Probably get an eleven. There's that story, isn't it, about Tony Cohen? It was sort of this season, isn't it, about <laughs> when he was in the squad, wasn't he? Yes. And the, there's the famous story, allegedly, <laughs> that. Graham Taylor wanted to pick him, didn't he, for England? But Peter Swales, who was the <laughs> City chairman, yeah, like they, City would have had to have paid like an enormous bonus, yeah. wouldn't he? Today, but buying from Birmingham did do something, yeah, uh, yeah. And the allegation is, is that words might have been whispered into certain managers' ears about not not selecting players, you know. But yeah, Coton was excellent, excellent yeah. keeper, top mm-hmm. class. But yeah, Dennis Mortimer was. But that, that, I think that was a really that was probably the biggest league game of the season because I think Villa took a lot of confidence in that win, didn't he, when he beat, they uh, did. Yeah. beat Liverpool 2 0. I think he gave him a lot of belief. We go into February. Early in the month, Crystal Palace owner Ron Nodes sacked Malcolm Allison and appointed Dario Grady, the fourth Crystal Palace manager of the season. On player transfers, Don Givens leaving Birmingham and joining Sheffield United. Frank Worthington was loaned from Birmingham to Tampa Bay in the NASL. Terry Venables signed Jerry Francis from Crystal Palace. It was said that Jerry Francis was somewhat left confused with all the comings and going-ons of the managers, and he was delighted to join Terry Venables at QPR. Brian Clough sold off Martin O'Neill to Norwich. And he also offloaded Larry Lloyd, who went on to become the youngest league manager at the 4th Division Wigan. In the same month, Nottingham Forest lost the Intercontinental Cup to Nacional Montevideo in Tokyo. Interestingly, around this time, there was a lot of talk about proposing Sunday football. Western goalkeeper Phil Parks was vocally opposed. And he said that, uh, that he doesn't like to play on Sundays because he will no longer have time for his wife and children. Plus, most people have routines on Sunday, whether it's going to church, pubs, visiting friends. It just shows how things have changed since. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Also, we'd mentioned about Liverpool's struggles. Bob Paisley was questioned about it. And he said, he mentioned some of the injuries. And he said that when everyone is fit, I give this team another two years because of the understanding they've got. He said they are not old, but mention the injuries. They did have a few at the start of that season. But the Sunday football one is quite interesting, isn't it? Because... I think this is the season, the saying at the start about Gates had fallen and there was a lot of things about, you know, this was the season when he decided on the three points for the win as well, wasn't it? Yes, at the end of the season, yes. From the following campaign. So I think there was a move to try and change things around. There was Sunday games, I think, in this campaign, wasn't it? I think so. But it never took on for years, really, until live television. But... You could see things with they were trying to bring in new ideas, but because the other big change in this season, which worth noting as well, talking about television, this was the first season where Match of the Day and ITV changed schedules, didn't he? Match of the Day went to a Sunday, didn't he? This oh, campaign didn't from the okay. Saturday night, you remember? Uh, yeah, and ITV used to do the big match, didn't he, of a, of a Saturday night? It was all part of the deal that had happened, I think. Now, remember the still called Snatch of the Day? Yes, yes, I remember that, yeah. <laughs> in 1979, where ITV had got all the live highlights, hadn't he, for football and cut the BBC out. Yeah. And then there was all, like, political machinations and stuff. And one of the outcomes of that was, was that ITV wanted highlights of a Saturday night. So you saw the change in the way people watch football. They never really sat right I don't know about you, Steve, but I never sat right with my ITV on Saturday night football. 
No, Even when the Premier League started, it just didn't didn't seem. No, it never seemed right to me. It, it, I just grew up with match of the day, Saturday night, the big match on Sunday. But yeah, yeah, I guess yeah, you just get stuck in your ways, don't you? <laughs> but yeah, um, it's it just it's never worked. And the match yeah. of day was on a mad time. It was at five o'clock of a Sunday Sunday night yeah. tea time. And as Phil Parks was saying, that's when people are all the time with the families and stuff, you know. But yeah, uh, yeah no, no, it was it. But yeah, Sunday football will take years to stay on. At this point now, you can see where the game's going, can't you? Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, you can see where the game's going. Because I remember, when, like, this, this will be for another later podcast, but when they were, there was a sort of TV blackout in 1985-86, and they were talking talking to go with, like, with Screen Sport, who were like a sort of up-and-coming satellite station. Yeah. And then there was talk of a Super League, and you kind of think, well, you can see where it was heading you know, in the 90s, so... Yeah. With, yeah, yeah, so interesting stuff. Yeah, but you mentioned Don Gibbons. Um, I think he went to Sheffield United, and there's an interesting game the last game of the season in the third division. And I think Sheffield United had to draw at home to Walsall to stay up, and they were 1 0 down. And Don Gibbons stepped forward to take a penalty and missed. And he never played for Sheffield United again, and they were relegated to Division Four. And I think the Sheffield Wednesday fans have called that Thanksgiving's Day. Now, oh. <laughs> as a bit of a <laughs> as a bit of a dig towards towards their own city rivals. But you know what? I've, uh, I've never heard that story. That's good. yeah, that's good. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's it's quite a dramatic story, really, because I think Walsall got a penalty, and no one pretty much wanted to take it. And Walsall, yeah, because because if I think if Walsall would draw now they've gone down I think if I remember rightly but yeah it's a bit of a dramatic yeah like, like I say the Sheffield Wednesday fans um, seem to enjoy yeah, it yeah to, to be fair he's another one who was a fine player wasn't he Tom Gibbons? yeah he was yeah, yeah. yeah. capped by the Republic down not England you know, yeah very seriously yeah. you know, with the <laughs> links yeah. to uh, Republic and there was also one other thing that took my interest in February was QPR was sort of um coming up with the idea of a sort of artificial pitch for the following season. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah this is what I'm saying. You can see they're trying to bring in the nations yeah. Yeah, because they were talking about, obviously, they didn't want postponements and they wanted it to be sort of multi-purpose, so like it could be used yeah. for hockey, for example. Yeah, it's got quite an interesting development because I, I don't know if anyone used to play on those old-style pitches. They were horrendous, but the, the yeah. modern ones are quite nice. But Yeah, yeah. So it'd be a couple of years, wouldn't it? I think maybe a year after or yeah. something like that before it was yeah, brought so, to yeah, I think it might have been. Yeah, I, I don't know if it was next season or season after QPR were the first team, weren't they? But, yeah. yeah, yeah. And then there was trying to think about them. All the mad one. Preston, Preston had Preston one. Preston and Luton, Luton, I think, were the others. Luton was the, of, of, Luton was yeah. the infamous one, really, wasn't it? As a yeah. bold. Yeah. Yeah. That was one everybody remembers Luton's. And obviously, when, when Oldham had theirs, it kind of coincided with their really good team they had. And, so some yeah. some people some people are saying is it the pitch is it the players but I think it was definitely you know they're a good team. Yeah, so you've got to win you've got to win away from home haven't you to be a top yeah, top yeah, exactly, club yeah. you know but uh, yeah, yeah it, it was the horrible games to horrible games to watch on a plastic pitch. <laughs> yeah. um, I never you know never like like watching it yourself and I haven't said all that about all of them I think it, if you played on it all the time I think it did give you it must have yeah. given you a bit of a competitive advantage surely yeah. you know. Ridiculous! There was like players' boots, didn't he? Like with their astro yeah. boots and stuff. And it was, it was, yeah, it was not one, not one of the best innovations, I think. No. So we come to March, or near the end of the season, and there were some before the deadline transfer deals. Peter Nicholas of Crystal Palace and David Price of Arsenal were exchanged. Steve Walford left Arsenal to join Norwich. Tommy Langley of QPR and Tony Seeley of Crystal Palace were also exchanged. Alex Cropley left Aston Villa to join Toronto Blizzard. Craig Johnson at Millsborough. Liverpool signed him, but for the following season. And they also signed Bruce Groblar for the following season. This was Ray Clemens' final season at Liverpool. Bruce Grobler at the time was at Vancouver Whitecaps, I believe. Steve Daly left Man City and joined Seattle Saunders. Einar As, Norwegian defender, left Bayern Munich to join Nottingham Forest. Larry McMenemy signed Alan Ball, we mentioned before. He was 35 years old at the time. He joined Southampton from Blackpool. And also, 
Chris Woods joined Norwich from QPR. Incidentally, Bobby Robson almost signed Chris Woods, but apparently Chris Woods was willing, but by the following morning, he had changed his mind and he signed for Norwich. So that's another what if. Didn't, uh, know, didn't know that either. He, yeah, no. Chris Woods has had an interesting career, hadn't he? Played yeah. for Forest, hadn't he? In the, the League Cup yes. final. 78, yeah. 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 And I, you forget about the spell of QPR, but I think yeah. it was a lot of teammates' name, wasn't it? Really, I think you know he was, he was he had a had a long career, didn't he, Chris Chris Woods? I didn't know that. Not a, that if it's in for him, no. Interesting. Yeah. And we should also mention that in the following month, Steve Highway would leave Liverpool and join Minnesota Kicks. So his long career at Liverpool was over. During this month, you have the League Cup final between Liverpool and West Ham. By all accounts, it was a 120 minutes of mediocre football. But there was some controversy during this match. Initially, Alan Kennedy gave Liverpool the lead, uh, taking advantage of Alvin Martin's half-kick clearance. But it turned out that Sammy Lee was offside. But after a consultation with the linesman, the goal was awarded. With the minute remaining, Alvin Martin's header was handled on the line by McDermott and Ray Stewart scored from a penalty kick. At the end of the match, John Lyle approached a match referee Clive Thomas and called him a cheat. So you have a replay on April 1st, this time at Villa Park. This was the first time there was TV live coverage in this competition's history. Liverpool dominated the match. Paul Goddard gave West Ham the lead. Then Alan Hansen header led to Billy Bond scoring an own goal. And Kenny Daglish would score a beautiful goal where he controlled Terry McDermott's 20-yard lob pass. And Liverpool would win the League Cup. And this would be their first, I think they would win the next four League Cups, if I'm not mistaken. In this month of April, on April 4th, Crystal Palace are officially relegated. There are still five matches remaining. On April 7th, Ken Knighton is sacked at Sunderland and Mick Doherty is appointed in his place. On April 10th, Everton announced that Gordon Lee would leave at the end of the season. And of course, that's when Howard Kendall would take over. Yeah, and the interesting, interesting story about Howard in this season is, you know, you told me before when Venables left Crystal Palace, uh, Howard was at Blackburn at the time and he, he was offered the job and turned it down. The job at Palace, so 80s football might have been different mm. if Howard did not if had taken up the, the job at, at Palace and not joined Everton at the end of this campaign. He also got very close with Blackburn as well. I think it was a goal difference that they didn't yeah. come up. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you mentioned you mentioned West Ham there. We've got to we've got to talk about them that season, haven't they? Really, because they dominated the second division. They were really a first division team playing in the second division. West Ham, when you see it, see yes. the players they had. They had won the they had won the FA Cup the year before, hadn't they? And then in yeah. and then they reached the League Cup final. Took the full to a replay. Yeah, so like you say, they were definitely a class above in the second division. Yeah, you look at the look at the team on paper, and it's just yeah. one of the first division players, and there's ludicrous position, ludicrous yeah. thing. But in the, the in the second division, that was that was the season when they, they went out went out in Europe to need to Tbilisi. Yeah, yeah and they, they they played a game behind closed doors in the oh yeah, yeah 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 because yeah. um because yeah. there's well, some yeah. crowd, crowd trouble. Yeah. Yeah. Great team, great team, West Ham. That's it's, it's a, it is amazing, isn't it? How football's changed because obviously. A team like West Ham wouldn't, if they got relegated, wouldn't be able to have players like that in the second division or in yeah. the championship now. And yeah, um, and it's looking like you say that was the first League Cup final to be shown live because the original game was just on a Saturday and it was never shown live, was it? It was just, just yeah, yeah, strange when you think about it. But yeah, well, the um, FA Cup final was broadcast live and the League Cup final wasn't. So it was only, yeah, it's just, yeah, it's a bit, I, I bit think odd. it only became, I think again, for another pod, I think it only became. Broadcast live, you know, when because it was part of the contract about broadcasting league football live from eighty three, eighty four. Yeah, I think yeah. it was part of that deal, wasn't it? It was, uh, yeah. yeah. 
But yeah, it was a bit of a bonus, wasn't it, Wednesday night at Villa Park? <laughs> yeah. And it was significant that was Rush's first big game for Liverpool. Oh, OK, yeah. Ian Rush. That was a controversial thing. You know, you've mentioned this. Alan Kennedy's disallowed goal at Wembley was yeah. controversial, wasn't it? Because I think, uh, like I say, John Maher went mad. And if you ever watch the match of the day of that, Jimmy Hill basically accuses Clive Thomas of saying, <laughs> He loves the limelight. He's a decent effort. He loves the limelight too much. He reminds me of Mike Dean a bit, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He loves the limelight too much. And yeah. that he'll, to try and get in the limelight, he'll stretch the boundaries of the laws of the game to uh, <laughs> get a bit of publicity. Which yeah. he'd had some, because it's his whole career had been littered with that, hadn't he? We'd obviously had the famous Everton semi-final disallowed goal against Liverpool 77. The ludicrous disallowing of that <laughs> Brazil goal against Sweden oh, in the yeah. corner in the last kick of the game. And also, you probably mentioned this, Sahan, is that he, he was the effort at Hillsborough, wasn't he? For the Wolves Sport, Wolves Bears. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, and Kenny Hibbett got accused of diving, I think, didn't he? Diving, yeah, yeah. And there was, yeah. Thomas was the referee then, wasn't he, I think? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so he, he's very much in the news around this time. Just... He, he, Clive would have loved all that, wouldn't he? <laughs> <laughs> oh, definitely, yeah, yeah. As far as the league campaign, this month of April sees Aston Villa take over and we see that Ipswich is slowly running out of steam as they also lose in the FA Cup semi-finals to Man City. I think the big thing to take out of that, they, they lost the semi-final in extra time because it, 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 it went to extra time for the first time, I think. And they, it went to, and they lost to Man City at Villa Park. But I think it was two or three days later, they then went back to Villa Park and beat Villa, which was an astonishing achievement, really, because right. they must have been on the floor in terms of their morale. But then, yeah, yeah I, think, I think the game's caught up with them and there's sort of the Easter weekend. I think they lost to Arsenal, then they lost to Norwich and I, I think the game's just started catching up. Right, a little bit. right. Yeah, they, exactly. they lost to Leeds, didn't they? And I think... Yeah, they, three they nil, had a couple it? of iffy results, but yeah, that was the, the famous... The league game, as you say, Steve was a couple of days yeah. after. But what did they say? The, the victims returning to the scene of the crime. I think, <laughs> exactly. Wasn't it? And if you um, ever, if you ever have the misfortune to hear Alan Brazil on Talk Sport, he, he he probably mentions the fact that Ipswich beat Aston Villa three times that season. Times, yeah, about yeah. about every five minutes. But, but well, that that was the night, wasn't it? The famous quote from Ron Saunders, wasn't it? That they've got on Villa Park, isn't it? Because the interview Ron Saunders after the game said, "You know, point behind." Yeah, I yeah. think if she still had the game in hand, and he did that thing, uh, do you want to bet against us? Yeah, yeah I do remember and, that. No, and no. that was after that game, wasn't it? And I think yeah. that, I think that's it. I, I think Philip Park, they've got all quotes, haven't they? And I think yeah. that's one of them. Uh, yeah. That, they, that, that was that night in April 81, when he yeah. tore six, which are now where... Uh, but I remember the, the, the Arsenal game very well. You did a, you did a number on them. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, it was a smash and grab, yeah. Yeah, I always remember Arsenal in the early 80s, were not exactly expansive away from home, really. <laughs> oh, can I, 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 instead of saying boring, can I say functional? No, yeah, functional. Yeah, <laughs> functional. Yeah. We were a yeah, very no. difficult team to break down, you know. We were, uh, we were a bit drab, yeah. Don Howe was, uh, had them perfectly drilled, but you, you had a decent scene. You know, 8, 79, 80 he's obviously played about, never mind, it's 66. <laughs> yeah. that was, did you play about 70 games? 70, yeah, 70. 70. Yeah, yeah. 80, 81. Uh, it's, still, it's still a really decent team, to be honest. It's, with yeah, it's a strange, strange season for Arsenal because Liam Brady left, but they still finished third. Obviously, yeah. quite a long way behind Villa and Ipswich. But, yeah, um, and the bit split team knocked it out the cup, by the way. Oh, that was the first defeat outside Wembley since 77, yeah, for, in the yeah. FA Cup. Because I think Kenny yeah. Sanson might score a known goal. Yeah, um, and I had the Goodison Park, you know, so... Yeah, uh, I, I had made a note of that, but... Um, yeah, I, I, yeah. I, 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 yeah, I, I didn't <laughs> need to, actually, you know, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah. But, but uh, yeah, it was, yeah still, Arsenal's still a decent team, and yeah. that, that, was a, that was a bad defeat, that for Ipswich, and I think... Yes, it was. Know, it's, it's going away from us, uh, you know? Yeah, because I know, I, I think the previous month in March, George... He had an operation on his knee and he's out for six months yeah. apparently. And and I think BT kept with it. Um, Kevin BT he was injured as well. And he's probably playing on one like Kevin BT was, was yeah. wasn't he? I mean, that was playing. the thing with Ipswich. I think you know, as you say, Villa could get away with fourteen players. Yeah, Ipswich once you got past player number twelve or thirteen, there wasn't yeah. a lot. Steve no, McCullough was used to come in and he like, sort of filled in. 
Yeah, and Kevin O'Callaghan, I think, plays yeah. a few. But once he got beyond, I think Mitch Stafford, I actually started playing this. Might have done, yeah, yeah. There wasn't, there wasn't a lot of ones in East. No, there wasn't. No, it's, and obviously it's... playing so many competitions, so many yeah. games, I think it, it, it took its time. Yeah, and it, the wheel started to fall off big time for them in, yeah. in the league this, this, this month. So by the end of the month, Aston Villa is just one point away from winning the title. At the end of the month, Man United sack Dave Sexton. And so we come to, on May 2nd, Aston Villa sealed the league title even though they lost. Because Ipswich lost as well, I believe. They lost to Middlesbrough, is it? Yeah. Yeah. Ipswich's season wasn't over yet because they still had the UEFA Cup Finals. Just a few days later, Ipswich defeated AZ67 Alkmaar, Dutch side, in the first leg of the final. They were able to put the disappointment behind them in just a matter of days, which speaks on the quality of the side. Aston Villa, this was their first title in 71 years. We'll go into the detail about the whole 14 players and all that. We still have the matter of the FA Cup as well. In the FA Cup, the first match, because there would be a replay. So on May 9th, Tottenham faced off against Man City. The match ended as a 1-1 tie. And five days later, on May 14th, there's a replay. This time, Tottenham wins 3-2. And the whole famous Cardo Villa goal that's entered the FA Cup legend. Tottenham would repeat as FA Cup champions the following season. But uh, I don't recall. What was their previous FA Cup before this for Tottenham? 61, the double season? 67, I think. 67, oh, so, yeah. yeah. 67, it, was, so. it was a very, very busy month. That. I think and I know we think it'd be useful to rewind so back to that final day of the league season because, Steve, obviously... Yeah. It the, you were heavily involved, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it was, I think it became known as the transistor match because there were so many Aston Villa fans yeah. in the stadium with, with radio stuck to their ears that, yeah, it became known. And I think during the game, Pele was, um, or the half time or before the game, Pele was there as a guest of Arsenal. Yeah, it gets and, better, this, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 And mm-hmm. I think the Ars- Arsenal fans were seeing sign him up, apparently. But, yeah. Um, but then, yeah, that, as you say, you know, Arsenal won 2 0. Um, yes. And I think Ips- Ipswich were beating Middlesbrough. 1-0 2-1. 2-1, yeah. Yeah, Ipswich win them 1-0, weren't yeah. it? And then was it Bosco Jankovic scored a couple of goals? It, it was, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah because yeah. I think what it was, Ipswich had two games left, Villa had one, and if yeah. Ipswich won both their games, they'd be champions, so it didn't really matter what happened to Highbury, to Izzy Gray. It was all about yeah. what happened to, to Ipswich. Yeah, and, and that's then, what transpires, wasn't it? You know, uh, you know, know Villa... They, they, they ended up playing happy. Southampton. So, sorry, Gavin, they ended up playing... Um, Southampton in between the two legs of the UEFA Cup, I think, yeah. if I remember right. It's ridiculous. Yeah, it's mad, that, isn't it? Yeah. But then you get, yeah, so, as you say, it was, was this is like 40 years ago, people were age old. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was just part of the culture, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. And there was loads of fella there, wasn't it? It was absolutely Oh, fair. yeah, 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 there's loads of... Right, right, the, the, the clock ends, what is it, the clock? Yeah, yeah the clock ends, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 But, the, um, but then you get to the set, get to the FA Cup final, and... And obviously the famous Tommy a, Hutchison. <laughs> yeah, it was a bit of a dire game, wasn't it, the first one? Tommy Hutchison scored and then... Was it classed as a known goal? Or a hoddle? I think it was. I think it was yeah. classed yeah, as a known goal. That was a dire game. And, and Ricky V got taken off in a strop, didn't he? Yeah. Famously. Yeah. And then they play... I, I, I don't know what... Why did they play the Thursday night? It was because there was... Yeah, I, I, it was, it was, it was just playing, but if she's playing the Wednesday... There was was an that England, the reason? But, yeah, there was an England game though wasn't there is that right I've got the note England played oh, Brazil. Brazil yeah Brazil were in town I think uh, yeah, at yeah. Wembley yeah. sometime right so I don't know if it was that day game. but uh, I think it was the Wednesday maybe and then the FA Cup but, uh, the you know, FA Cup final on the Thursday yeah because they were the, talking sorry yeah they were talking and apparently but all the managers and all, all the players were saying we don't want a penalty shootout because they were saying we, we can't have another replay effectively <laughs> and they're saying you can't decide the FA Cup final and a penalty, shoot, penalty shootout and obviously that now happens, but right. so that, that again shows how things have changed. Yeah, because th- this was always the problem with the cup, which thankfully never happened. Is it, yeah. in 77 when Liverpool, when Man United beat Liverpool in the final, 
Dearest they they could get for the replay was the twenty sixth of June. <laughs> that would be brilliant. Yeah. Because because England were going on the South American tour, so you had like the home internationals and then England were going on the South American tour in June seventy seven. <laughs> The early state you could get for the replay was like the, something like the 26th of June. <laughs> so it makes you wonder really what would have happened if, yeah. I mean, it, it would have been horrendous trying to uh, arrange <laughs> another game. But the, the replay was a really good game, wasn't it? I mean... Yeah, uh, and there's that, there's that forgotten goal by Steve McKenzie. With a, a yeah, oh, wow. Wow, well, yeah. Yeah, it yeah. Was a, that was a brilliant... A brilliant goal which is overshadowed by Ricky's moments of uh, moments in the sun, isn't it, really? Yeah, and I always remember the Ricky video goal with, with if, if you ever look at the footage of Garth Crooks at the bottom of the screen and his, his foot just twitches as Ricky Vida's about to shoot. Have, have another look one day. Oh, right, really okay, funny. yeah. Oh, it's okay, but, yeah. So sometimes yeah. when you sit, if you sit on, sitting on the sofa at home and you, your foot's going, it's a bit like, bit like that, Garth Crooks. Yeah, yeah, all right, okay. Yeah, because, I mean, people forget City were winning 2-1 in that game. They were up, weren't they? Yeah, they were, yeah, yeah. yeah that's, in, that's in both games. But yeah. Ricky, Ricky scored, Ricky scored two. I think it was a Garth, Garth got the second, didn't he, I think? I think Garth he did, Cooks. yeah, yeah. I think Garth Crooks scored, yeah. But, uh, yeah, the, 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 it was a really good game. Probably, you know, one of the best, one of the best cup final ones I've seen. Really, really good match. Days later, you have Ipswich winning the, the UEFA Cup despite losing to AZ 67 Alkmaar 4 to 2. So they did not leave the season empty handed, which they fully deserve a trophy for the season they had. On May 27th, uh, Liverpool, who finished fifth this season, they won the Champions Cup by defeating Real Madrid 1-0 with Alan Kennedy's goal and continue for the fifth season running the England domination of the Champions Cup. A few decisions were made by the chairman in the season. One of the decisions was that managers should not be contacted during the season. They also decided on Sunday football and three points a win for the following season. Getting back to what we said earlier about why Ipswich did not win the title, Bobby Robson was quoted as saying, Aston Villa has played 19 matches less than us. They could play regularly each Saturday and could prepare better than us to last the distance. We went from one match to the other without thinking of training. From an objective standpoint, one would have to say that probably Ipswich was a better team. Certainly, most of the players would probably be remembered better, I would say. But Aston Villa, with their long ball out of defense and target man style, won the title. And would build on that and win the Champions Cup and UEFA Super Cup a season after that. But as far as the league, that was it. I think you, I think think, you yeah. can. I, I'm sure, for, I don't recall Villa being a long ball team as such. You know, they had the big striker. I mean, I think, like a lot of the best teams, he had a great, real balanced midfield, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. they had more, like Morley and Cowens and players like that. Were fantastic. Yeah, Morley, Cowens, Mortimer. Mortimer. Yeah. Um, was a really... You know, a lot of Villa fans say that Gordon Cowens was a best player. I mean, he would have been the one player I think he might have got in the uh, in the which you know, like if he did the combined one. Yeah. I mean, they had the big striker, but they didn't. I don't recall really him being a long ball team. They had the. Uh, I mean, Tony Morley was quite strange. He was he was he was one of them first players to play out wide on the wrong wing, wasn't he? Yeah, he was. He yeah, that, see, he, all, nah, see all the time now. He got goal of the season against Everton, didn't he? He did. When, yeah, when yeah. He him, <laughs> but, but, but you could see Villa's you could see Villa's quality that day. Yeah, yeah. And you can yeah. see the quality. I say Dennis Morse was run from the the. Yeah. Gordon Cowan's craft, Des Bremner was a good um, But library. there certainly was a feeling that this was a one-off, right? Did anyone think that they, this may be a rain starting? You know? Yeah, like I see. No, I think because of the age of the team, to be honest with you, there was like Peter Wyth was near in the end of his career, wasn't he? I mean, yeah. the one player who thought was thought really was going to kick on, it was quite sad that because the end of his career was Gary Shaw, wasn't he? Yeah, because he, he got a bad injury, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah, with striking partner and Gary Shaw was for the young lad was a real clever uh, player. 
he, he, his term wasn't it that gave the ball to Tony Morley goals really just yeah a bit like Kenny Zaglish you know Gary Shaw would have been a tremendous player but he, he got injured but people like I mean, Ken McNaught had been at Everton years before Alan Evans there was a strong Merseyside connection wasn't there I think yeah. well obviously Ron Saunders was born in Birkenhead on the Whittle play for Everton but Kenny Swain James Dennis Mortimer Tony Morley Peter Whittle all from Liverpool or the vicinity, you know, so it was quite big, uh, big Liverpool connection there with Fella. Now, you you are right, you never thought there was going to be a great legacy, uh, though they were a good team for two or three years after. You I mean, don't win the European Cup, do you? If you no, it, it, it might, it might have been, in, it might have been interesting, obviously, if Saunders had stayed for longer, yeah, than yeah, fair point, for, yeah. For a bit because, because, yeah, because that team did go on to win the European Cup, and it was basically his team that went, went yeah. on to win it, but yeah, it might have been interesting if it stayed for say two or three years where yeah. they would have gone. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a good point. I thought that's a really good point. I may, may, may see a different outcome. But, so, uh, so let's it? name the 14 players who took part in the season. You have Des Bremner, Gordon Cowans, Ken McNaught, Tony Morley, Dennis Mortimer, Jimmy Rimmer, Kenny Swain, ever present throughout the season. They played all the matches in the season. Then you have Gary Shaw, Alan Evans, Peter Witt, and below them you have Gary Williams, Colin Gibson, who had 22 and 21 appearances, and finally you have Eamon DC and David Geddes, who only had nine appearances. This is probably something that could never be achieved today with just 14 players. And no, it's astonishing, really, because <laughs> it was a four, it was 42 matches in the league season, wasn't it back then? And right. Yeah, um, the FA Cup. And yeah, FA yeah. Cup. So I, it's, I think it's in a strange way. I think they lost to Cambridge quite early, maybe in the League Cup, and they lost to Ipswich, obviously in the FA Cup. In a strange way, that probably did help them. But then you know, Ipswich fans would have probably looked back on that season with a great deal of joy because you know they did win the UEFA Cup in the end. But yeah, because Ipswich probably, what, like Gavin was saying, probably had like eleven or twelve. Players, but you know, over a sixty-six match season, you just can't you can't get away with that, unfortunately. But yeah, I think I think that's it. I mean, well, I mean, teams like Liverpool have got into that groove, haven't they, over the years of no. playing twice a week and you know how to manage yeah. the players and stuff. But for likes of it, which was a relatively relatively yeah. new thing, you I'm, know. I'm glad I'm, I'm glad they held on to win the UEFA Cup though, because yeah, yeah, I yeah. think. I think it was ten minutes longer that final. They might have struggled, but yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Because they, 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 it was four. It was a three four two the second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, it, but they, they, they was a, that there's a. They, they, I'm just thinking there a link. Obviously, former Ipswich player was David Gaddis, who, who got a few games for uh, yeah, yeah. for Villa. And did Colin Gibson go to Man United? No, he didn't go. Did he go? When did he go to Man United? Colin Gibson. Uh, did, did, I believe he did. A few years later, yeah, I think. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Yeah, you forget Colin Gibson plays that many games, to be fair. But, yeah, I think one man who definitely deserves a mention is John Walk, isn't it? Because um, yeah. I think he scored in every round of the UEFA Cup and he, I think he equaled the record for the amount of goals in the UEFA Cup in a season. And he, I think he scored 36 goals in the whole season. So, yeah. And obviously he ended up at Liverpool in a, a few years later. From, yes. from, from, uh, and ended up, it ended up in the, being an escape to victory that year as well. Is, yeah, like, <laughs> quite a lot of Ipswich players, yeah. Yeah, yeah, like a lot, yeah. So that's what, that's what you reward, you know, you get yeah. for it, yeah. Shane, Shane's walk, wasn't he? Was that hell of a lot of goals, that, isn't it, for a midfield player? And he, he went yeah, to Liverpool. Yeah. Maybe, near, maybe a bit of a strange one, that, because he was nearing the end of his career walk. He wasn't... Yeah, he, he wasn't young, I think, was he? 30, something like that, yeah. he would have been. But... Maybe not 30, late 20s. Not a Liverpool signer, but yeah, he, he was a master of arriving late, isn't he? Oh, he was, yeah. And he, uh, yeah. I, I, again, I'm not sure whether players like that exist anymore. <laughs> no. No, you I know? guess, obviously, Frank Lampard used to, in the yeah, yeah. Past, he used to get a few goals like that, but mm. yeah, 36 goals. I know they played a lot of games, but that's, <laughs> that's an extraordinary effort. Yeah, for yeah. Midfield, I'm, yeah. I'm, I say you're 15, like, was, was yeah. that, I presume yeah. that was some sort of record, was it, Steve? I think, like he, I think he equaled a record by Real Madrid I think it was, but yeah, but yeah, so yeah, it was, d- 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 who was the team of the season in 881? It's a good, it's a good question, isn't it? Because yeah. Lee Villa won the title, but Ipswich, well, yeah, yeah. Ipswich, uh, as far as the player awards uh, for the footballer of the year, it was an Ipswich sweep. It was Francis Tyson first, uh, Mick Mills second, John Wark third. 
as far as the PFA Player of the Year, it was John Wark. And the PFA Young Player of the Year was Aston Villa's Gary Shaw. But even in terms of players and journalists, it seems like Ipswich has a slight edge in terms of preference, despite not winning the title. Yeah, yeah. I, I, th- I, think, I think in some respects, both clubs can feel a bit hard done by, can't they? That Phil, yeah. I think, always felt, as you say, a little bit overshadowed because, and maybe people sniping at, well, Ipswich beat you three times, you only won the title <laughs> that. Right. Because Ipswich, you know, ran out of gas. But at the same time, if you're Ipswich, you can think, well, actually, we got one trophy, we've never really been given the, the credit that was given, considering that, you know, as we've just discussed here, haven't we? The amount of games mm-hmm. that they played was just, just ridiculous. And in some, both clubs can feel a little bit. You know, that maybe not got the credit. But I remember at the time thinking it was Ips- it was about Ipswich, wasn't it, that year? I don't know. You know, yeah. I think well, it's it's because Bobby Robson's PR was great, wasn't it? You know, it was you know, that, that was the whole thing with Robson, wasn't it? Where Saunders was you know <laughs> I mean, I put it this way, I can't see Ron Saunders agreeing to a, a a fly on the wall documentary like Man City <laughs> can do, like, you know. No, but, definitely not there. Yeah, I don't think Saunders has agreed to that. I think Saunders' image probably ran against, sort of worked against uh, Villa, I think, in how they were regarded. As I was researching, I also came across the fans' player of the year for each club, but not for every club. I couldn't find from every club, but just to kind of give you a run through at Arsenal, it was Stapleton, at Aston Villa, it was Peter Wheat, at Birmingham, it was Alan Ainscar. At Brighton, it was Mike Robinson. At Coventry, it was Danny Thomas. At Crystal Palace, it was Paul Hinshelwood. I was not able to find who Everton's was. At Ipswich, it was the goalkeeper, Paul Cooper, actually. Yeah. Uh, Steve McMahon was Everton's one. Uh... Oh, really? Oh, so yeah. he was yeah. player of the season for Everton. At Leeds, it was John Lukic. At Leicester, it was Mark Wellington. I couldn't find out who was at Liverpool. At Man City, it was Paul Power. I couldn't find out at Man United. At Millsboro, it was Jim Platt. At Norwich, it was Joe Royal. At Nottingham Forest, it was Kenny Burns. At Southampton, it was Ivan Golak. At Stoke, it was Peter Fox. I couldn't find out who was at Sunderland. At Tottenham, it was Huddle. At West Bromwich Albion, it was Brian Robson. And at Wolves, it was Paul Bradshaw. My, my initial thoughts, a hell of a lot of goalkeepers in that list, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, there was, yeah. Yeah, yeah about a yeah, third of them are goalkeepers. Flat, yeah. yeah, Luke Hick, Fox, Bradshaw yeah, was a keeper. Bradshaw, yeah, yeah. yeah. Cooper. Yeah. Um, there's well. Jim, Jim Platt was mentioned in dispatches there, wasn't he, Middlesbrough? Yes, yes. Hell, hell, of a lot of, hell of a lot of keepers on that list. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll give you that. But also, I've got the PFA team of the season. If you oh, want to, go ahead. Yeah. Just, just look for completeness. So, so that's that's actually got Peter Shilton in goal. I think that was just the case every year. The <laughs> Kenny Swain, Kenny Swain, and Alan Evans, Russell Osman, Kenny Sansom, who I think was also pretty much a staple through the eighties of the PFA teams of the season. Franz Tyson, John Walk, Graham Souness. Kenny Daglish, Paul Mariner and Gary Shaw. So I think from that, we've got four Ipswich players and three from Villa. Yeah. So that again gives us an indication, you know, Ipswich had you know, some really talented individuals and Villa just I, I, that, that strong, yeah. solid team. Yeah, at that time, you're always going to have Daglish soon after Shilton in. Yeah, yeah, oh, and yeah. Sanson after yeah. that as well, probably, yeah, yeah. if we yeah. go through the season, Sanson. we'll probably They're find a lot of Four yeah. of the best players in the country, there or thereabouts. You know, yeah. so. I, I, I am surprised that I know it's a bit of a joke that Shilton always got him, but I am surprised that season he would have got him because obviously Paul Cooper was very good and there's you know a lot of good goalkeepers. But. Yeah, yeah, it was just it's just discussion there, you know. Well, I mean, tell you, I had a really good season with Phil Parks at West Ham. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. That's just sort of what West Ham. I think, was, was he the world's most expensive goalkeeper and he was playing for West Ham, Steve? Was, <laughs> he, he was. I've, yeah, I've, yeah he was. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 It's madness. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
But uh, yeah, so incessant campaign. Yeah, sixty-six <laughs> points in the second division, which was a record since World War Two. Yeah, uh, yeah. Was, I mean, not surprised. Not surprised yeah. with that team. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the top goal scorers that season were Steve Archibald, the Tottenham, and Peter Witt, Vassal, with twenty goals each. Yeah. So, what's your general takeaway of the season? It was mainly Ipswich, to be honest. I, I, you know, no, no disrespect to Aston Villa because they did win the title, but mm. it, it, it kind of following their sort of long season and you know the, the eventual sort of collapse in the end of their title bid. Obviously, the extraordinary feat of Aston Villa using 14 players to win the title was, was amazing too. But just looking back, it's just br- brilliant to sort of see how loved the FA Cup was still back then. I know I'm going to yeah. sound like a bit of an old granddad now. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but do you also think maybe it's a case of Liverpool having a bad season and other teams taking advantage? Yeah, possibly, uh, yep. Yeah. I, 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 you, it's a good one. I think both. I think in a, I think both Villa and Nipswich collectively were good enough to win the title, even if Liverpool had a really good season. It's, it's yeah. funny how we, it's funny how we say that Liverpool had a bit of a dodgy season, but they they ended up winning two cups, didn't they? The European Cup. Yeah, and the yeah. I think it, was the, <laughs> it was the only year between seventy three and ninety one where they didn't finish mm. in the first two. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I don't. I don't. I think Villa and Ipswich could. The title, both title winning teams. I mean, yeah. Rob, Robson's Ipswich remind me. I know we'll probably talk. Remind me a little bit of Pochettino Spurs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where over two seasons they were the best team in the country. Yeah, but didn't win the title in either either year. You know. Yeah. And I think that there's echoes of echoes of that in in Pochettino Spurs of Bobby Robson's Ipswich. But yeah. Really Campaign, uh, lots yeah. of you know, we're seeing we're talking about stuff here that in the future it's up, you know, like Sunday football, plastic pitches, all that type of thing. Yeah, uh, you know, there was there was lots of you know, three points for the win. You know, there's a, I think a feeling in the game that they had to start moving things along to make it more attractive for spectators. Yeah, Paul, what do you remember from the season? Yeah, well. Yeah, you know, Ipswich having a having a great team and maybe Villa just having that more solid team and definitely the connection between the, the squad sizes and the number of games. I think that's that's obviously played a massive part in the in the outcome of the season. And like Steve, just remembering the FA Cup final as the kind of centrepiece of the season, you'd get all day coverage. And yeah, partly that was obviously because you didn't have other games televised. You know, there was very very little opportunity to to see that but that was as a kid just the the high point of the season really was when the the FA Cup final came around and then maybe just looking at it it's an overview like like Gavin said there's obviously a lot of talk about what they can do to to improve the game and improve entertainment because the attendances were down again it was sort of each year I think for well it'd been happening for decades but it was becoming more pronounced I think the attendances were down again as a total of about three million from the previous season, so it's just over twenty, uh, just nearly twenty-two million was the total. And bearing in mind that had been total football league attendances had been up forty million immediately after the war, so they'd, they'd almost halved. Um, so hooliganism was still a problem. You know, English football still had a lot of problems there that that they were looking at. I mean, Jimmy Hill again, also the architect of the three points for a win, was already talking about all seater stadiums and I think Coventry experimented with that next season so it's another another glimpse of the future and just to mention a couple of a couple of clubs further down that maybe don't always get a mention but they, these are going to be historic seasons in there when you look at their history so as well as West Ham you have Notts County coming up to the first division for the first time in a long time and for the first time ever Swansea City so we'll we'll probably talk about those a bit more next time, but great achievements for them. Uh, you've got Newport County reaching the quarterfinals, the European Cup Winners' Cup, which, uh, again, is a bit of history. And uh, the final Anglo-Scottish Cup, which was won by Chesterfield. So some some great moments for some of the smaller clubs there as well. But yeah, it was a, a, a season, you know, when I was really starting to, 
to get involved in watching as much and learning as much as I could about football. I remember quite a few of the games and, and most of the names that we've that we've mentioned. And yeah, in English clubs winning two of the three European trophies. And uh, yeah, we'll we'll see what develops over the, the course of the decade. But yeah, it's, it's an exciting season to start with. Another thing I want to mention, and me and Paul have discussed this before, but uh, I'm looking at the final standings. And in those days, it was, and not just in England, but let's say in Germany or other leagues, it was not uncommon for a team that ended up as champions to lose six, seven, eight matches during the season. This would never happen today. A team that loses eight matches in a season would never end up as champion in any of the major leagues. And it just shows just how there was actual competition between the teams that no match was decided in advance. And I guess in comparison, nowadays, you see like a team like Man City going playing against a team that's far inferior in terms of resources and you know they're going to win 4-5-0 and but at this time nothing was taken for granted teams had to earn their wins and it reflects on all the leagues and not just in England I would say uh, yeah I definitely agree I, I, obviously the nature of the blog I write I'm, I'm always sort of banging on being nostalgic but at the start of quite a lot of the seasons obviously Liverpool would be the, the team to beat but you'd often get like a season like 80, 81, where they had Villa and Ipswich. And obviously, Everton started to emerge as the decade went on. It, even teams like Tottenham were competitive at some point, and then obviously Arsenal towards the end of the decade. But, but like you say, there just didn't really seem to be as many easy games. Like I, I, think, I think Man City beat Watford 12 0, sort of an aggregate last year in the two league games. And I can't really remember that happening loads in the 80s. I might be um, remembering it with too, too, too much fondness. But that, yeah. yeah. Definitely more com- competition, I think, back then. But. Yeah, and it, and it was better for it, wasn't it? As a oh, de- oh, definitely, definitely, yeah. You know, and, you know, it was that old thing, wasn't it? You know, the championship, you know, you have to wait till Christmas or whatever for the championship race to, yeah. you know, to have, have a pattern now. It's after about three games, isn't it? You know? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I think, um, yeah, I mean, even, even the great Liverpool teams would lose. Yeah. Would, I remember Liverpool losing. Five times the yeah, season. Yeah. Yeah. After four two games, I mean, I mean, there's obviously anomalies for us to think lost two or three did the band year they won the title. Yeah, Leeds, I think. But that was an anomaly. Yeah, yeah, Leeds yeah. under Levy, I think maybe one year they, they lost a couple of games, but yeah, it's, it's all the better for it, isn't it? You know, yeah. it's that nonsense, isn't it? That now, oh, the Premier League's the best league in the world because everybody can beat it. <laughs> Give and die. I mean, that's just no. a load of cobblers, isn't it? You know? <laughs> it is, yeah. But in 80-81, they could. I mean, as you just say, I think Brighton were the only teams to be different in Aston Villa at home. And didn't Leicester beat Liverpool twice that season? And Leicester yeah, Leicester beat Liverpool yeah. twice yeah. and Leicester went down. Brighton yeah, yeah. went down on the final day, you know. So, yeah. yeah. And I think I think that, that the, the quality players were spread across a lot more clubs, weren't they, as well. I mean, we were just talking... So, so and you said that at the start, you were through looking at the teams there and the teams near the bottom of some of them have got well, it's just talking about Brighton, Mark Lawrence. Yeah. At the start, you know, when you mentioned the Brighton team, there's some really good players there. You mentioned West Ham as well, didn't you? And obviously yeah, West Ham, West Ham you know, yeah. in the second division having those players is amazing. But. Yeah. Um it spreads spread over a large, larger group of teams and it's yeah. lost, it's a bit soulless now, isn't it? I think. Uh, yeah, it doesn't have the wage differentials either. Yeah, where yeah, no. pretty much every team, you know, obviously yeah. Liverpool will be I mean, paying a bit more, but yeah, I mean, it's just the disparity you'd get now. Yeah, yeah. I'm just thinking in 40 years' time, if we were to if you forget about the COVID, so if we're reviewing, reviewing recent Premier League seasons, mm-hmm. there wouldn't be a lot to say, would there? No, the, the last the, apart from the COVID bit, the last season you would have said, well. Liverpool took ages to lose a game and that was about yeah. it. And then... <laughs> there's that, there's, there's no richness of detail and... No, no. Little sto- unique story, unusual stories. It's so predictable yeah. and one-dimensional and stuff, isn't it? You know, 
And I, that, uh, yeah, a lot longer talking about the transfers and how much people have spent. Them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. Sure. Deadline but, day. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, yeah, we wouldn't be doing that. Because that's that, that's the other thing, isn't it? You're talking there, Sean. Said on November such and such moved and stuff. Wouldn't be having that now, was you know? But yeah, yeah it's, it's pretty soulless now. That's why I like doing this type of stuff, you know. Yeah. Once again, I'd like to thank you both. This was a very enjoyable podcast, reliving football of our childhood, I would say. So once again, we would like to thank Mr. Buckland and Mr. Pai for their participation in this series. Always feel free to leave questions and comments. For any questions and comments, you may contact us. I'm on Twitter at SP1873 or on my blog, Soccer Nostalgia, and on their Facebook, under Soccer Nostalgia. Mr. Paul Whittle is on Twitter at 1888 letter you may also follow the podcast on spotify under soccer nostalgia talk podcast mr buckland's contact info is on twitter he's at gavin buckland one and mr pi is on twitter at 1980s sports blog and the name of his blog is that 1980s sports blog dot blogspot.com and all this information is listed in the blog and uh, podcast posting so once again thank you gentlemen this was very fun and cannot look forward to the next one thank you thank you yeah thank you both very much that was yes. great yeah thank you, thank you. cheers thank see, you. see you all take care yeah take care Bye. Cheers, bye. Bye. Take care, Gavin. Take care, bye. Stephen. Bye. Cheers. Bye. bye. All the best.